Okay, if everyone will please take their seats and then rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> Sit down and then stand up. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Will the city clerk please read the roll? Mayor Litt? Here. Vice Mayor Reed? Here. Councilmember Woods? Here, ma'am. Councilmember Marciano? Here. Councilmember Tinsley? Here. Are there any additions, deletions, or modifications this evening? No, ma'am. In that case, we will have an update by the Weiss School students from the Wolfpack CubeSat development team and the Aerospace and Innovation Academy. It's good to see you again. Let me guess you're growing plants on Mars. <laughs> Soon. 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 Thank, thank you for having us again this year. It's really nice to be back in, in person and see you. I know we have some, uh, a PDF that we had sent in today. We'd like to share a few slides with you. Good evening and thank you for allowing us to present. My name is Kevin Simmons. Um, six years ago uh, at Weiss with about four kids we started. Fast forward to today where an LLC, a nonprofit, a 501c3, we have 40 kids here in Florida and kids in other states and we travel the world uh, presenting. Uh, just want to share a little bit about the Wolfpack CubeSat development team which is based here in Palm Beach Gardens. So um, the entire focus was to teach young people how to be uh, competent and capable and work in industry, especially in aerospace, because there are no low-paying jobs in aerospace right now. That's, that's a good career. So here you can see the teams that were formed. Um, we actually helped the very first team from Nebraska be selected by NASA, and that was very prestigious. We're proud of that. You can see the logos. These were designed by students. These are our missions. Uh, the three on the right are to, uh, this year's satellite missions. Uh, we are no longer at Weiss. We are embracing kids in Palm Beach County that want to be a part of our team. We have quite a few from Palm Beach Gardens. So we train the kids, of course, with high altitude balloons. I, I would love to find the right person to get permission to launch from the, the ball field sometime. Our balloons end up in the Caribbean or even as far as uh, we were 600 miles from Morocco with one of our balloons. We have buoys, they float in the ocean, and we track them. So this is a great way we train the kids about the satellites. Here was, of course, our first satellite that launched a few years ago. Those students are doing real well in high school now. And here is our second satellite that's scheduled to fly um, later next year. And, of course, our older kids want to be the first students in the world to put a rover on the moon, and these are two of our possible rides. And. That brings me to the student portion. Uh, my job is to introduce the kids and get out of the way and let them share with you what we're doing. So it's uh, my privilege to introduce uh, Sebastian. Good evening, my name is Sebastian Timble. I'm 12 years old and I'm in sixth grade. Today I would like to share with you about the Space Club hosted by Aerospace and Innovation Academy. Here I've learned some very interesting things such as um, aerospace, aerodynamics, Bernoulli's principle. And I also look forward to learning about the Artemis missions. Uh, the first cohort of the Space Club was hosted from January to April of this year. The second cohort, which is still ongoing, is from August to December. And the third cohort, which will be hosted from January to April, uh, will be next year. 
Graduates of the Space Club will be eligible to join the Wolf Pack. More on the Wolf Pack from our next speaker, Dini. Thank you. Uh, hi, I am Dini Vaitsos, a seventh grader at the Weiss School. Can you please uh, speak closer to the microphone? Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, hi, I am Dini Vaitsos, a seventh grader at the Weiss School, a school here in Palm Beach Gardens. Under the NASA CubeSat launch initiative, the Wolfpack CubeSat development team is currently submitting three CubeSat proposals. Wolfsat 1 is investigating idea nelosakenesis rates of plastic degradation on orbit versus 1G. Wolfsat 4 is investigating the use of metal oxides to prevent radiation upsets of electronics in space. Wolfsat 5 is characterizing the viability of rhizobacteria in space. We just presented at a preliminary de design review. Um, we currently pre we just presented at a preliminary design review at the Kennedy Space Center, and we got very uh, positive and helpful feedback. And now we're working on writing proposals to NASA. Uh, next up is Ava to tell you about the outreach. Thank you, Dini. So I am a seventh grader at the Weiss School, and. The in, and sorry, there's an outreach group of the Wolf Pack that is working on connecting with younger students as, as I'm sure you know, the STEM identity forms very, very young, so it is crucial to reach students at this time. And thanks to our outreach group, we have created an activity book slash coloring book, which is given out at local expos that members attend, for example, Engineer It, STEM Fest, as well as others. and. We are currently working on a children's book, which is created by students, authored by students, and is illustrated by students, so it's created completely by the outreach branch, and it is designed for students in other states, so for use in the classroom, basically. And the, our teachers, Mr. Kevin Simmons and Ms. Shauna Christensen, have created a how-to book for other educators, and next up is Audia to discuss conferences. Hi, I'm Adia, and I'm a 12th grade student at William T. Dwyer High School here in Palm Beach Gardens. And an another thing that we do with the AIA is participating in conferences, whether they're local, national, or even international. We submit abstracts of more technical papers to these conferences, and hopefully we get selected to write a paper and then present them. Our most recent conference that we attended was the International Astronautical Congress, which actually just happened last week in Dubai. We had six papers being presented, and I was on, on the team of one of them, where we presented about lunar dust mitigation on spacecraft in a low-gravity freefall environment, where we basically talked about the problems that face lunar dust because of its um, ionic charges. And we also talked about the Amaris rover, which Mr. Simmons was just talking to you about. Um, in the future, we plan on participating in even more conferences. Upcoming for next year in January is the International Conference on Education, and we actually have seven papers being presented there. And as you can see, there's so many more conferences, whether they're international, local, or even just national happening in the future. And to summarize, here's Mr. Simmons. Apologies. Uh, that really concludes the presentation. If there are any questions, I'd enjoy a chance for the kids to answer them if you have any. And thank you again for your time. Anybody have Mark? You? Well, I, no way can I ask a question that's going to actually be a part of the research that you're doing. But um, no, the children are coming from various schools. It's no longer just white. So can you give us a little bit of a rundown on where the kids are coming from? Absolutely. Uh, Sevi is homeschooled. Uh, we have William T. Dwyer. We have students in Suncoast, American Heritage. We actually have students from um, Hawaii that we work with uh, that have a ground station that we're hoping to talk to with one of our radios in the future. Uh, we have students that attend um, our Wolfpack meetings from uh, Fort Myers, from different places in Florida. We have had students from Pennsylvania, uh, North Carolina, Northern Virginia. Uh, we have one young man from Illinois outside Chicago. So we accept you know, the beautiful thing about COVID is because we had to pivot and we're on Zoom, why not make the tent a little bigger and bring in anyone that can join? So you're not limited by your folks' ability to drive you to wherever we meet. So 
And that's kind of a goal that you had when you were at Weiss, was to oh. try to find a way to expand it and let the kids grow further into it. So congratulations. And, and, and I want to thank you because you were one of our brown bag lunch speakers. <laughs> so, that's right. That's right. Uh, but thank you. Uh, yes, we, we welcome kids from all over, and we thank you for the opportunity, and we hope we can partner with you in, in some way in the future. We'd, we'd like to take a picture, and I wanted to ask, where's your funding currently coming from? That's a great question. Uh, we're raising our own money. Once we uh, started our 501c3, we have donations from uh, a, a small one from uh, my CubeSat. Uh, Ms. Christensen Shauna has a grant from Florida Space Grant Consortium. We had some money there. Um, wonderful, um, some folks raising money, but we just found out that the Florida Space Grant Consortium has given us $25,000 this year uh, for our future hardware. So that's a big win. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> I think. Now I'd like to call Chief Shannon to the podium, please. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members. It's a tough act to follow. I already warned my guys what was coming before them with the intelligence level. It sure is. <laughs> I think a couple of my guys were homeschooled, right? <laughs> but uh, that's an impressive group. Uh, and, and now I'll introduce you to another impressive group. Uh, this is our, our mostly uh, members of our traffic unit. If you guys can come up and just line up here somewhere behind me. I uh, wanted to let you know there's uh, the prestigious Florida Law Enforcement Traffic Safety Challenge uh, recognizes the best overall traffic safety programs in the state of Florida. Uh, this includes the department's efforts to enforce traffic safety laws and reduce the public uh, about or to uh, educate the public about distractive and impaired driving, motorcycle safety, occupant protection, child passenger safety, uh, pedestrian and bicycle safety, speed and aggressive driving, and other issues that impact the safety of road, roadway users. The Traffic Safety Challenge supports the department's goals of enforcement and traffic safety laws to reduce traffic crashes, uh, serious injuries, and fatalities. The Palm Beach Gardens Police Department was recognized as the 2020 first placed winners in the law enforcement agencies throughout the state of Florida of similar size. Uh, this recognition includes not only the traffic unit, but officers from within all uh, areas of our department that provide traffic enforcement throughout the city, as well as the supervisors that encourage and provide the training and equipment necessary for keeping um, our citizens safe on our roadways. Um, Below this, uh, these are some of the the um, 
the accomplishments of mainly of, of, uh, of these gentlemen standing behind you uh, in 2020. Uh, again, it's, uh, they're recognized by the state. This is a, a very, very challenging program, and it's extremely competitive throughout the state. Uh, as you know, uh, I don't think there's anywhere I go where I don't get the main complaints are all about traffic in our seat. And it's, uh, as we know, it's not getting any better. So the, the job that each and every one of them performs is, uh, is, is vital to our city uh, completely. So, but with some of them, some of them have specialties, but they all uh, do traffic enforcement. Uh, some of them do uh, impairment enforcement, uh, traffic homicide. Uh, so they, they hit every angle on uh, traffic issues throughout the city. Uh, and with, uh, with this prestigious award, we couldn't be prouder. Taking first place is a big deal. I got calls from many of my friends throughout the state congratulating us that we're competitive in, in this field, too. So, again, we just wanted to make sure that we could highlight some of the, the fine work done by the police department before you tonight. And, again, and thank you always for your, uh, for your support because this couldn't happen without that. And thank you to Ron, too. Thank you for keeping us safe. I think Mark wanted to, right? Uh. Sarge, Sarge, why don't you, Sarge, Sergeant Mull, sir, you want to have a word or two? Sure. Um, the group you see here is, is an outstanding group of individuals who contribute every day. They come to work every day looking forward to, you know, not necessarily going out and writing tickets, but going out and being of a service to the community to, to, to keep people safe. Whether it's the school zones and the crosswalks every morning, you can see them out with the crossing guards assisting in those areas, or, you know, bicyclists that are riding in the roadway, educating them, to, you know, with everything that, the, the amount of vehicles on the roadway now, pedestrians and bicyclists really, you know, take their life in their own hand when they decide to ride in the road. But we do what we can to slow people down the uh, community. Um, I'm proud of these guys. They, they work hard every single day whenever they're called upon. They're anxious to go and serve, and they're anxious to be there. And um, chief, the chief has, has just been the biggest supporter of us all, you know, giving us the equipment, giving us the uh, personnel in the unit, and um, just, just being supportive in all that we do and go to him and say, hey, we want to try this. He's like, let's see if it works, and then we're good to go. But, but thank you. We appreciate your support. Uh, Mr. Parrish, we thank you for your support, and Chief, we thank you for your support. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. We'll be, we'll be uh, providing all the elected officials with a copy of this photo. Uh, we advise you to carry it around in your car at all times when you're in the city. And just maybe, just maybe it'll carry some weight.
So next order of business is comments from the public, and I'd like to call Adrienne Pugh to the podium, please. State your name and address for the record, please. Hi, my name is Adrienne Pugh, 19902 Southeast Galbury Drive, Jupiter, Florida. I'd like to thank the City of Palm Beach Gardens for proclaiming November to be Family Court Awareness Month and explain why this is such an important issue in our communities. I am a domestic violence survivor, a protective mother, and a board member of FACTS, Families Against Court Travesties. FACTS is a nonprofit organization dedicated to ensuring the best interests of the child prevail in family court and that due process and equity are common practice. For the past 20 years, our volunteer members have been court watching in domestic violence, divorce and child custody, and dependency court cases. We often witness unjust, unfair, and unconstitutional practices in these cases, as well as a lack of common sense by court officials when any form of abuse is alleged. Domestic violence is about power and control. That desire to maintain power and control doesn't mysteriously vanish when the relationship ends, especially when children are involved. When you are court ordered to attempt to co-parent with your abuser, the family court system becomes the new platform for abuse. And the children either become pawns or new targets. Most would be shocked to know that in most states, family court judges preside with zero training in domestic violence, child abuse, child sexual abuse, childhood trauma, or coercive control. If they have any training, it's typically very minimal. Earlier this year, a four-year-old boy named Grayson Kessler from Broward County was shot and killed by his biological father during a court-ordered visit. Despite his father's history of abusive behavior and his mother, his mother Ali Kessler's pleas to the court to protect him. While this is the ultimate tragedy, FACTS has witnessed multiple accounts of family courts ignoring a protective parent's pleas to prevent their children from being court ordered into abusive situations. FACTS is very proud to collaborate with One Mom's Battle, Justice for Grayson, the Family Court Awareness Month Committee, and a variety of other national organizations all focused on bringing awareness and eventually changing these family court practices that enable abusers and do not protect victims. Our children's lives are literally depending on the courts becoming educated on these issues. I'm grateful to the city of Palm Beach Gardens for joining the list of countless cities, counties, and states that have proclaimed November as Family Court Awareness Month. Thank you for standing with us to recognize the, important, the importance of a court system that prioritizes child safety and takes abuse claims seriously. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. I have no other comment card, so next would be the city manager's report. Ron, do you have a report or announcements? Thank you, um, Madam Mayor, Council Members. Just uh, uh, some an announcements here about some of our community events. Uh, due to, unfortunately, due to the weather prediction tomorrow for 90% thunderstorms, we've had to move our Friday's golfing event, Ladies Nine Wine Dine, and the Mix Rip It, Grip It, and Sip It <laughs> Golf <laughs> Project. That's not easy to say, by the way. Uh, but it's been moved to Friday, November the 19th, uh, after the Veterans Day holiday weekend. Uh, unfortunately, we just don't want to chance uh, the, the bad weather, so we're moving that. However, uh, on Saturday, we're continuing uh, the Mayor's uh, Veterans Golf Classic shotgun start at 9.30. Uh, you know, in the past, we have raised over $424,000 for the veterans. Last year it was over 55,000. This is our 15th year. Uh, tee off is at 9.30. That is still continuing on Saturday. 
uh, our community concert series uh, by the group called Elements will be doing a tribute to Earth, Wind, and Fire. Uh, that's this Saturday at 7 p.m. right here in Veterans Plaza at the Amphitheater. It's uh, something that the entire family can, can come and enjoy, and uh, it's uh, brought to you and sponsored by the Frenchman's Creek Charities Foundation. The Veteran Salute Celebration uh, featuring the 13th Army Band will occur here in Veterans Plaza Thursday, November 11th at 11. We want to invite everyone out early uh, at 10 o'clock. I believe the band will start playing. We'll have the ceremony and the band will continue playing after the ceremony. That's the 13th Army Band. And if you haven't heard them, you're missing something because they're pretty good. We, we enjoy them. The uh, other thing is uh, we have films on the field uh, this is an outdoor event uh, in which uh, on Saturday the 13th of November at 7, uh, out at our Miracle Leave uh, turf field, which is out here in Gardens Park, uh, they bring a lawn chair or a blanket and sit down and watch a movie outside. Um, that's a children's event, so uh, bring uh, it's called, the movie is called Up. I don't know what that is, but apparently. <laughs> It's a good movie, I hear. Um, out, bring your own food and beverages and picnic and watch a movie with the kids. Starts promptly at 7. That's sponsored by Bylan Isles, uh, Bylan Isles Charities Foundation and Frenchman's Creek Charities Foundation. Don't forget the Green Market, uh, November the 7th from 8 to 1, right out here in the municipal campus. That's on Sunday, and we're celebrating our 20th year there. Uh, so, in addition to that, the never-ending saga of the traffic signal at Bay Hill and North Lake. Uh, the new date for activation is November 16th, and I know we'll all look forward to that date if it actually occurs on November the 16th. So, we're working with the county trying to get that done. So, I just wanted to bring those announcements and changes um, for everyone's uh, information, and with that, I conclude my report. Thank you, and while we're talking about all the wonderful activities here at the city, I wanted to thank Patty and her amazing team for our League of Cities luncheon <laughs> that was hosted at the Santo Crane Golf Course last week. Our food, our facility, we are the envy of the county, People could not stop talking about it. They were breaking down the, the line to get at those desserts before the staff was ready. But um, only only good things. So thank you for all the hard work that went it into that. It was a, tr a true team effort from several different departments. Thank you, and I'll pass that along. Thank you. Uh, Avi Prosecco. Oh, yeah, the dessert. Prosecco. Yeah, Avi. Oh, my goodness. Cool. Okay. Mm -hmm. So next is the consent agenda. Anyone pulling? Um. Madam Mayor, I'd like to pull uh, Proclamation G, the Family Court Awareness Month. Well, I don't need to read it, but I just want to make sure we uh, appreciate you coming tonight and, and telling us your story. And we're really proud to be repre um, representing on this proclamation. So thank you. And I'm going to pull Proclamation H, Hunger and Homelessness Awareness Week. So I will need a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda minus G and H. I'll motion. make a motion to approve minus G and H. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes 5-0. Okay, now I need a motion and a second to approve G, correct? I'll make a motion to approve Proclamation G. A second. Motion and a second, all in favor? Aye. Aye, any opposed? Motion passes 5-0. And I would like to read Proclamation H. I do have a copy where 
Whereas the state of Florida ranks third in the nation for the highest homeless population, and one in seven of the state's population struggles with hunger, and whereas the Palm Beach County 2020 homeless point in time count identified 1,510 individuals and families experiencing homelessness, and the Palm Beach County Hunger Relief Plan indicates that more than 300,000 residents struggle with hunger, Whereas the purpose of Hunger and Homelessness Awareness Month is to educate the public about the many reasons people are hungry and homeless, including the shortage of affordable housing in Palm Beach County for very low income residents, and to encourage support for homeless assistance service providers, as well as community service opportunities for students and school service organizations. And whereas the Palm Beach County Homeless Advisory Board has developed Leading the Way Home, a robust 10-year plan designed as the next phase of ending homelessness in Palm Beach County, and whereas the intent of Hunger and Homelessness Awareness Week is consistent with the activities of the Homeless Advisory Board, the Homeless Coalition, Homeless and Housing Alliance, Palm Beach County Food Bank, The Lord's Place, Gulfstream Goodwill Industries, Adopt-A-Family, and other service providers in Palm Beach County. Now therefore, I, Rochelle A. Litt, by virtue of the authority vested in me as mayor of the city of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, do hereby proclaim that the week of November 13th to 21st, 2021, in Palm Beach County, as Hunger and Homelessness Awareness Week. So can I have a motion and a second to approve H? I move that we approve Proclamation H. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes 5-0. And um, the reasons that I pulled and read this proclamation tonight is actually twofold. First, I had the honor to attend the ribbon cutting yesterday morning at Palm Beach State Palm Beach Gardens Campus Panthers Closet and Panthers Pantry with Vice Mayor Reed. This new resource at the campus provides food and clothing to students and faculty who are food and clothing insecure and helps students look their best for job interviews. It's run by the Honors College students and is operated by volunteer faculty and students. They are accepting donations and they are, there are flyers on the table for more information if anyone is interested. I know we have uh, Andreas here from Palm Beach State um, from the SGA today, but um, they really, it, it's an amazing place. It's both a pantry and a clothing closet, so. The second reason I pulled it is in support of Hunger and Homelessness Awareness Week, I asked the city manager if there was any way that we could allocate some of the ARP funds to support the Homeless Coalition's Creating Housing Opportunities Fund. After some research, we realized that because of the federal reporting that's necessary to account for those funds, the paperwork would require the city to have access to program documents and report on internal homeless coalition financial activity for the program. That would be both cumbersome for the homeless coalition and for the city. But Ron came back to me, however, with the idea of allocating money from the funds set aside for sponsorships that we've already approved in, in the budget. He assured me that we would have funding to allocate $5,000 from this source to help fund the Creating Housing Opportunities Program. Just to tell you a little bit about it before you get to weigh in, Creating Housing Opportunities pays for the first and last month's rent and security deposits for families and individuals who are ready to move from permanent supporting housing, transitional housing, or interim housing into independent permanent housing. The coalition was able to provide rapid rehousing services for 141 households this past year. 
The Homeless Coalition created and implemented Creating Housing Opportunities as an innovative partnership with nonprofits to secure safe, affordable, and decent housing for the homeless. Families and individuals served with Creative Housing Opportunities funds are homeless for shorter periods of time than those assisted with shelter or transitional housing. More homeless exit to permanent housing from this program than from emergency shelters or transitional housing. And this program is less expensive than traditional housing placement for the homeless. And those that exit through creative housing opportunities are less likely to return to homelessness as compared to those exiting from a shelter. So at this time, I'd like to ask my fellow council members for their support to use $5,000 from this fund for this purpose. I'll make a motion that we spend $5,000 to support the Homeless Coalition. I'll second it. Okay. I'll third it. You're in favor. <laughs> Chelsea, you're it's in favor. It's, it's, it's a good it. cause. Yeah. Thank you. I, th I think this is, is a great way for us to help this commu particular community that, that we so often talk about um, as, as needing the help, and we're in a position to do it. So thank you. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes 5-0. And thank you, Ron, for finding a way to um, make it happen, even though the ARPA dollars were not able to be used. Thank you. Okay, so read the quasi-judicial statement. Tonight, we are holding quasi-judicial hearings on the following cases. Ordinance 12, 2021, second reading and adoption, request to rezone a 3.89 acre parcel of land. Resolution 58, 2021, Request for a major conditional use approval, Ordinance 14, 2021, first reading, rezoning to change the zoning designation of approximately 2.08 acres within PGA National from planned community development PCD. Resolution 55, 2021, Site plan approval for 27 single family homes within Panther National Pod 13. Resolution 56, 2021. Site plan approval for 52 single family homes within Panther National Pod 14. Resolution 62, 2021. Approving an amendment to the PGA Station Plan Unit Development, PUD. This means that the City Council is required by law to base its decision on the evidence contained in the record of this proceeding, which consists of the testimony at the hearing, the materials which are in the official City file on this application, and any documents presented during this hearing. The Council is also required by law to allow cross-examination of any witnesses who testify tonight. Cross-examination may occur after the staff the applicant and other participants have made their presentations and will be permitted in the order of the witness's appearance. It is necessary that anyone who testifies at the hearing remain until the conclusion of the hearing in order to be able to respond to any questions. If you plan to testify this evening or wish to offer written comments, please fill out a card and give it to the city clerk. The city clerk will now swear in all persons who intend to offer testimony this evening on any of these cases. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to so help you God? I now open the hearing. Are there any ex parte's? Patty, do you want to read the title of that, and then we can? Yes, ma'am. I should do that first. Ordinance 12, 2021, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, rezoning certain real property within the corporate limits of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, such property being comprised of 3.89 acres in size, more or less, and located on the northwest corner of the intersection of North Lake Boulevard and Congress Avenue. 
otherwise known as the North Lake Square Planned Unit Development PUD, providing that this parcel of real property, which is more particularly described herein, shall have a city zoning designation of Planned Unit Development PUD overlay with an underlying zoning designation of General Commercial CG1, providing that the zoning map of the City of Palm Beach Gardens be amended accordingly, providing a conflicts clause, a severability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date and for other purposes. Resolution 58, 2021 is a companion item to Ordinance 12, 2021, and will require council action. Resolution 58, 2021, a resolution in the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens and major conditional use approval to allow a convenience store with gas sales and an accessory automatic car wash located on the northwest corner of the intersection of North Lake Boulevard and Congress Avenue on 1.76 acres, more or less, within the 3.89 acre North Lake Square Plan Unit Development PUD, as more particularly described herein, providing conditions of approval, providing waivers, providing an effective date for other purposes. Are there any ex partes on Ordinance 12 or Resolution 58? No, ma'am. Hearing no, none, do we need another presentation on this? Again, hearing none. I do have one comment card. Will Ramona Bean please approach the podium and state your name and address for the record? Uh, good evening, Ramona Bean, 5439 Cicada Way, Palm Beach Gardens. Um, good evening, Mayor Litt and uh, Vice Mayor Chelsea Reed and Council people and city staff. Uh, the reason I'm coming up is actually I was able to sit through the first reading of this uh, last month, and I first wanted to say thank, that you, thank you that you guys actually asked about the EV uh, charging stations. Um, so I have a couple of questions as clarifications tonight. I know we don't need to necessarily hear the whole presentation again, but um, I've tried to look through um, all the links that are available on the website for citizens, which is great, so thank you. The one clarification, I wanted to see, did they did they uh, get to a point where maybe they could do a level two or level three for the EV charging stations? The second clarification question I had was, um, and I got reminded about it actually yesterday, sitting with lots of motorists stuck on North Lake Boulevard westbound because of that unfortunate crime incident by um, Chipotle. Um, the driveway access on North Lake Boulevard, I'm assuming, it, it looks like it said it was extended to a proposed 84 feet now for the driveway throat, I guess, distance. So just a flair, clarification for a lot of citizens, just understand, does that mean like, if we're driving westbound on North Lake and we wanna turn into the 7-Eleven, we can't make it on the Congress, can we pull in and not necessarily back up traffic? So it's just a simple question and request. Thank you. That's it. <laughs> Can I call the presenter up? Brian Seymour will answer the questions. I believe you did say by the end of the presentation that we were going to get level three charging stations. Is that correct? See, when someone is focused on something, they remember it. Uh, for the record, Brian Seymour, on behalf of the applicant, yes, we did. Uh, I will reconfirm, and I appreciate Ramona's questions. Uh, they are important questions. They're going to be level three. As to the access, in addition to there being additional stacking on site, we also, assuming the county permits it, which I'm going to leave at that, um, uh, we have a right turn lane that we all, well, I would say as soon as the county permits it, we will be trying to get it permitted right away. And as soon as they say yes, we also put a right turn lane in. So you'll have additional stacking to pull off, decel, and then turn in. You'll have further distance than you have now once you're on site to both move. Uh, left or right once you get to that that point so, so that will, will require county because action. it's not because the right turn lane is on north lake and the county controls those permits it will require a county roadway permit um i'm happy to discuss those processes separately if anyone wants to individually i'm good thank you thank you and I do also want to make sure that my ex parte from last time carries over to this time. Nothing has occurred since. Nothing, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to close the hearing on Ordinance 12. Can I get a motion and a second to approve Ordinance 12? I'll make a motion to approve Ordinance 12. I'll second. I'll bring it back for discussion. Do we have any? Further discussion on the zoning change? There are no changes. Just grateful for the EV stations. Well done. You, they'll be full. Don't you worry about it. Mm -hmm. 
So I want to say it out loud and on record. Art in public places. We had any discussions on this? Sir, uh, again, Brian Seymour, thank you, uh, Councilmember Woods. I, I forgot to mention that. We, we are talking about where we can do it, whether we can do it on site. We are going to try. Uh, I checked in with uh, Mr. Laxo from uh, Creighton, who's the construction manager, about whether he's been able to figure that out yet. It all has to be coordinated with 7-Eleven. We're working through that. We will make the effort to put it on site. Uh, I know that's important to you. Uh, Somebody said something about a huge Slurpee cup on top of the building. <laughs> is, that, is that true? Um, it has to pass our AIPP I don't, committee. I don't, hey, I, didn't say I don't think that would get past Natalie or Joanne <laughs> or Don in, <laughs> at all. So no, I'm not even gonna ask. You know, if you look at those big buildings out there, <laughs> We had to turn down DeVosta because he wanted those DeVosta signs to be AIPP too. And we said, no. I mean, I. I or no, it was the. the it was the, the pyramids. Lit, yeah, the pyramids. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm happy to, to have the beautiful 7 Eleven colors be the AIPP, but I don't think that's happening either. No. <laughs> we will look for opportunities. Let's just try. It's such a good spot. You know, I always push that. And I know. I know Mr. Jablin would want it too. I appreciate that, and we will give it a shot. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anything else? All right, in that case, hearing no further discussion, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 5 0. And the clerk has already read the title for Resolution 58, so I will open the hearing. We've said there are no additional ex partes on Resolution 58, uh, other than what's carried over from last time. Um, we do not need a petitioner presentation on that. Okay, and I have no cards on this particular item. So I'm gonna close the hearing. Can I get a motion and a second to approve resolution 58-2021? I'll make a motion to I'll approve resolution 58-2021. I'll second that. Bring it back for discussion. Any discussion here? We're good. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 5-0. Okay, so ordinances 13 and 14 will be a combined presentation. For each ordinance, we will separately have the title read, open the hearing, declare ex parte separately, and vote on each. So will the clerk please read the title for ordinance 13. Ordinance 13, 2021, an ordinance to the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, adopting a small-scale amendment to its comprehensive plan, future land use map in accordance with the mandate set forth in Chapter 163, Florida Statutes, pursuant to application number CPSS-20-11-000014, in order to change the land use designation on 2.08 acres in size, more or less, from Golf G to Commercial C, providing a notation on the future land use map pertaining to the permitted land use density and intensity related to the subject property. The subject property being located within PGA National immediately adjacent to the PGA Resort core at the southern terminating end of Avenue of Champions, approximately 0 0.50 miles south of PGA Boulevard, providing for compliance with all requirements of Chapter 163 Florida Statutes, providing for transmittal to the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity, DEO, providing that the future land use map of the City of Palm Beach Gardens be amended accordingly, providing a conflicts clause, a severability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date and further purposes. Note to the public, there is a sign-in sheet at the front desk for anyone wanting additional information from the Department of Economic Opportunity. Madam Mayor. Um, due to the fact that uh, resolution uh, 60 and 61 are companion items for ordinance uh, 13 and 14, I'm going to recuse myself of those items. Of ordinance 13 and 14 or 60 and 60? We'll do all of them. All four? Yep. Okay. All right. Um, staff presentation. Actually, we're go, we're going. Oh, yes, we do. Um, Ma Madam see, Clerk, Mayor, yes. I'm just going to also explain why I think that's also required. Um, my husband is a shareholder for WGI, which is doing the landscape design, 
and traffic for this project. Thank you. Okay. So are there any other ex partes on, well, on this? This is not a um, ordinance 13 and oh, not is not 14. We can declare when we get there. Okay, so we're going to have uh, Ken Tuma do a presentation. Good, good evening, uh, Mayor, City Council. Ken Tuma with Urban Design Studio. My address is 610 Clematis Street, West Palm Beach, Florida, 33401. Here tonight on behalf of Brookfield Properties, who own PGA National, the resort, and the golf course. Um, the presentation I have for you this evening is about 10 to 15 slides and we'll get through it fairly quickly. We'll just bring you a few updates though. Over the course of today, as you know, this particular project has, has, uh, has uh, been discussed pretty heavily within the PGA community over the last few days. I've spent this afternoon meeting with some lovely women, mostly by Zoom, uh, Evelyn and Nancy, who are two uh, representatives of one of the closer homeowner associations to this. We spent some time on the phone, went through the project. While they don't agree with the water slide concept, uh, we did have some understanding of the design of the project and some of the high qualities of the project that's bringing, but they didn't agree on the water slide component and also had some other questions, which I'm gonna address those as we go through here. I know they're listening on the video today, so I wanna go ahead and just put that in the beginning of the presentation. So thank you again. I will go fairly quickly through the show here. It's a big project, take your time. Thank you, Mayor, I appreciate that. This is, there are a lot of items that are happening. Really the purpose of all the things on the screen in front of you, the requests, are to allow for renovations, updates, and new things at the PGA Resort. There's a small scale amendment, a land use amendment. There's a rezoning from golf to commercial. There's also modifications to the PCD master plan and then also a plan unit development and site plan amendment that will come before you on the second reading. And there are two waivers, and those waivers are part of it, are a three foot, 10 foot, three foot, 10 inches, and that is definitely a typo, three foot, 10 inches height increase for trellis above the water slide and a four foot rear setback between the common area property lines. In essence, those changes are to add additional land area from the golf course to the resort core. You can see identified in the screen these areas, 0.56, 0 0.02, and 1.5. We're changing the land use or requesting to change the land use, the zoning, and bringing those into the resort core to allow for the, to allow for the redevelopment of a portion of the site. And here you can see on the screen the existing land use and the existing land use and uh, designation and currently we have golf on the south you know, and around it and what the request is to add those into the commercial land area and then finally the request the final re part of this request is to modify the PCD master plan there's an overall plan that has ruled the, the property for many years and this plan will not be modified to bring it up to date to match what's being proposed today. And I forgot to mention when I started out that, um, you know, today I'm filling in for Ms. Booth. Well, I'm not really filling in for Ms. Booth. Ms. Booth retired, but also a very important fact, today her granddaughter was born. And I know Anne's listening. It happened about three hours ago and she texted me. So the, the areas of improvement that are part of this application are identified on the screen because ultimately all of those other requests are really for these five items. The first item, I'm going to start at the top, is the pickleball court, the request to add an additional pickleball court. There's a small tot lot there today. That tot lot will be removed and will be placed interior to the facility. The second thing is to update or to include a gatehouse as you enter into PGA National. The third is to modify in the southwest corner of the site to modify the member club approach to create a call to, to create a roundabout and also to help separate traffic items where carts and and gall and uh, vehicles are conflicting with one another. I know most of you have probably been back there, but this will definitely make it much more organized and create a new drop off in valet. And then finally, in the southeast corner, which is the creation of a pool and a lazy river within the resort to create a unique asset to this project. 
So first I'm gonna focus in on the gatehouse. The gatehouse will be a central gatehouse. The idea from Brookside is that this becomes a concierge service for people coming to the resorts. The members will have a FOB to come in or an RFID to come in. So members who are members of the club will travel along the eastern side or, or travel along the, the, the right-hand side and go through the uh, bypass lane and they will, have, they will have the RFID to come into the site. And then res, uh, guests will come through the main gatehouse and the main gatehouse, they'll st be stopped by the guard. They're not required to show an ID, but they will be stopped by the, the guard there, and the idea is to create a concierge service for the, re for the people coming to the hotel. Um, there is also a required significant amount of coordination, especially during the Honda Classic. All these facilities have been built high enough to allow for buses and fire stations to come, uh, fire vehicles to come through. Also, there will be addition of several smaller gates because these gates will become exit only here and here. So everyone who entering the pro entering the PGA resort will come through the gatehouse, but you can go out through separate ways. And this is a view of the gatehouse. Um, your staff has done a good job reviewing this, and our client has done a, what I consider a really nice job on architecture. So as you pull into PGA National now, you're gonna be stopped here at this beautiful gatehouse. A guard or an attendant is going to come out and they are going to talk to you, explain to you where to go, and become kind of a concierge service, kind of that first stop as you come into PGA National. Um, on access and circulation, the access and circulation is a question that has come up for many years. As you know, there is an existing bridge that connects the tennis courts to the uh, community to the left on the screen. There will be a gate added to that, which will also have a FOB pass for you to come in and out. And then it will also be open and monitored with a guard during the Honda Classic. So it will be open with a guard monitoring how people cross the bridge during the Honda Classic. Pickleball, everybody's favorite subject. A new pickleball court being built over here by the existing pickleball courts. Oopsies. I jumped ahead a little bit here. So the pickleball court is on the screen in front of you. It will be existing, it will be uh, similar to the existing ones and the hours of operation will be exactly the same as the existing courts. The tot lot will be removed. Here in the bottom left or the southwest corner of the site, are the improvements to the members club. This is the new drop off area and valet parking. Kind of a little bit more detail. What it does is it improves both circulation and stacking to allow a more, little more distance. And it also tries to separate the golf cart and the vehicle traffic to try to avoid conflicts. On the right-hand side now on the spa, I suspect most of you have been to the spa. It's under renovation now. The, the concept of changing the spa parking lot is to bring the parking just a little bit closer to the spa and then also improve access and also have some ADA spaces there also. So on to the topic that I suspect has everyone's attention, which is the pool, the lazy river, and the slide. The, the uh, facility is proposing to put a significant investment and to create a family, a family entertainment area within PGA Resort. The idea for the pool and the, the, the pool, the lazy river and the slide is to have families come and not everyone in their family golfs. And the idea is to have something for everyone there. Our client is here and he will certainly come and talk to you about their reasoning and logic why they wanted to do this. But they believe, and I believe too, that this is a great addition to PGA National. It allows for the addition of a lazy river a very nice pool, additional pool element, and also a water slide, which I think will attract some young children who will have a lot of fun on it. So let's start with the proposed improvements. On the screen in front of you is the Lazy River. First thing's important to note, 
that this pushes the golf tee just a little bit to the east, the existing driving range tee is being moved a little bit to the east, not very much. There's an existing building that's gonna be torn down now, kind of the big picture of what's happening is you have a pool area and you have a lazy river and you also have a water slide. There are three structures that are going to be constructed as part of this. The first one is the mechanical room here on the north side. There's also a, a food and concession area and then this is a bathroom facility. And then the balance of this site, which I will show you in more detail going through this, is the water area. Its intent is to have beautiful landscaping, lots of seating areas, places for people to relax, and just become a very nice resort atmosphere. The name of the community is PGA Resort, and the idea of this is to become a resort. It will also have the same hours as the existing pool. The water slide will close at dusk every night. There will also be an attendant slash lifeguard on that water slide every time every, during the times that it's open. It will be open to the hotel guests and the club members, and the idea is to make this portion of the resort more family oriented. So kind of first the big picture to give you an idea of the view of what this looks like. It creates a beautiful pool area with a resort theme, with a resort theme. You can see on the right-hand side of the screen some of the structures being constructed. In the background are the water slides coming from the water tower. And then in the foreground is the pool. And I have a few more slides that kind of explain how the pool works. But the pool's really neat. It's total, its maximum depth is 54 inches. The, the lazy river, is, which is this nice area where water flows through, you get on a tube, or you float down and after you get out of the slide, it's 36 inches of depth. And then there's also this zero ledge where you come in a beach-like structure where you come in where it's a very long area that's very minimal depth of water, but it creates like a beach-like feel. So first, let's start with the structures. There's a food and beverage building, a very small food and beverage building. It's between six and 700 square feet. Here's the food and beverage facility. You can see the nice architecture and how the colors uh, adapt nicely to the landscaping and just fit in the area and the brick pavers and then a significant amount of landscaping that is surrounding it. And that's just to give you an idea of the landscaping that is in the entire uh, Lazy River pool area. The next structure and a very important structure and one that uh, I would be focused in on is the mechanical room. It is a big building. There are a lot of pieces of equipment required to run this type of facility. It's about 3,600 square feet, if I remember correctly. Uh, but a couple important things to note before I get into the details. First, the pumps for this are seven feet below ground. There are no above structures for pumps. They're also located within this building, and this building also has sound attenuation. There are louvers on the building. Those louvers are decorative in nature. So to show you kind of what it looks like, this is what the mechanical building looks like. And again, the louvers on the south side are decorative in nature. And this is a view of the architecture uh, from an elevation view. You can see the sound attenuation and then the architectural features of the louvers. The next structure is a structure of the water slide itself. And how does this work? How does it operate? Well, first, it is a water slide, and you can see in the background here, and I'll show you in pictures in a few minutes, but you can see in the background, what it is, is it's a tower. You walk up a staircase to the, first, to the top of the water slide. The top of that staircase brings you to a height of 30 feet. And then on top of that, there's a trellis feature to block the sun, and that goes up to an elevation of 39 feet, 10 inches, if I remember correctly. So when you walk into this, what happens is you walk into the staircase. The staircase isn't a normal staircase. The staircase has a planter that's 42 inches in height as its, as its rail as you walk up. And then it has planting of two to three feet above that, which matches my height as six feet. So it's not an open rail system. It is blocked and it's obviously very well designed with lots of impact, lots of info, information and impact from your staff 
is a 42 inch concrete or 42 inch planter and then the, the growies or the plants are on top of it. So as you walk up the staircase, you won't be able to see your head from the outside of the staircase because the growies will block that. And the reason why that's so important is because it is a, visual, it is a tall thing. And the idea here is to block any views or noise from the residents. A couple other items here. So first, as I said earlier, it's on the screen, six feet of screening on the stairs. There are decorative louvers on the building itself or on the structure itself, and then enhanced screening on the base. There is not one layer of screening before the first house. There is not two layers of screening before the first house. There are three separate layers of screening from the closest house, which is 375 feet away. So there's a significant amount of landscaping that's been added to this to make sure that the view is blocked from the residents. But as I said earlier, you, you, as you can see, you climb up the stairwell here, you're walking up, you can see the planters, and then you come in and then you go down the stair, go down the water slide. Um, you'll see the water slide here in green. The green was a color that was picked to help make sure that it is as minimally obtrusive as possible. And then there's a significant amount of landscaping. In some areas, there are replanted royal palms, which are 25 feet in height. And then there's a significant amount of landscaping spread throughout the site. So this is a view of what the, from a technical standpoint, what the elevation of this facility looks like. And again, I just want to walk through the staircase so you understand what's happening here. You can see those are planters and not a regular handrail like when you're walking up the, the, the a regular building. So this is um, another view of it from the front. We saw this view a little bit earlier, but now that you kind of have a concept of what's happening, kids slide down the tubes and then they come into the lazy river and they float to the pool area is the design intent of this. Um, this is a, another view of the equipment building. This is a kind of a little different angle so you can see the pool from a little different spot. And then also in the background you see the wash slide. In regards to the landscaping, I'm going to spend a few minutes on this because it's very, it's very important to make sure that this is very well landscaped and also creates that buffer slash separation from all the residents to the south. First, there are a significant amount of trees as you can see kind of the layering of trees. This is the first layer that we talked that you saw when we showed the royal palms and the trees in front of it. That's the first layer. Then there's a second additional layer of trees here. And then finally, this shows kind of how all three layers are done. The closest home for a frame of reference is the patio homes, and they are 375 feet away. Here's that first layer of landscaping. Here's the second layer of landscaping. These are a uh, second layer of landscaping. These are clustered pine trees proposed here. And then here there's a significant amount of existing landscaping. And then here we're, we're uh, providing many different tree species, but primarily composed of a, a live oak grove. And these trees are of significant size. And then also you can see in the background that there are existing trees throughout the area. And let me blow in a little bit more detail so you get an idea of what that buffer looks like. You can see the existing trees. There's a 20-foot high tree here. There's a 20-foot high existing tree. Here we're proposing clusters of pigeon plums, pl clusters of pines and sables, silver buttonwoods, and the proposed oak grove. Those trees are planted, the oaks are planted at 15 feet of height, and, um, and a significant amount of landscaping for that entire area. So the next question, and this is for the folks that I spoke to earlier today, how far am I away from this? What does it do to me? So first thing, the closest home in the patio homes is 375 feet, and I'll use my football analogy for that one. It's more in a football field. Then this distance is 1,000 feet to uh, Villa de Corsa Road, and then another 1,000 feet to the point, and then 1,800 feet here to Augusta Point a very significant distance away from the water slide. Now, 357 feet. This is taken from 
being standing up at 36 feet of height. Don't vote against it because of the picture. It's the only one I had. If you if you had if if you were up 36 feet if you were up 36 feet of height, which is this is an, an accurate picture. So I just wanted to take a second, just for a second. Yeah, so I went to Ticketmaster today, and I, or, and I said, what's 36 feet of height? Well, it's the B deck at Ohio Stadium, or Joe Robbie, wherever you want to call go. And the separation of 300, this is actually, should say 375, oh, so typo there. But that's the distance to the opposite of where it says Ohio State, the top of the S, is 375 feet away. Ladies and gentlemen, I will, I will convince to you that you will not be able to see a person standing down there, because I certainly wasn't when I was at a football game. So height waivers, we do have a height waiver for the water slide trellis feature. What's allowed is 36 feet of height. We're requesting to go to 39 feet 10 inches and that's really for the trellis itself. And that trellis is an important item because it's to provide shade at the top of that facility. Remember, we're gonna have a lifeguard up there at all times. The existing hotel heights vary between 36, nine and 50 feet. We are requesting a small waiver of three feet to allow for this trellis feature. The, um, the public benefits include all the additional landscaping and screening, including the building facade on the base and also on the golf course. There is also a small other waiver requested, and this is for the members only club. The members only club, this is an existing condition that's there today. 15 feet is required. Four feet is an existing condition, so we're requesting to bring that up to regulations to allow it to be consistent with the plan and potentially uh, address the common area property line. So just a quick summary of the request. A small scale map amendment for first reading. That's modifying the land use from golf to commercial. Um, the second one is you have to rezone the property because now you're rezoning it from golf to commercial. The third one is to modify the master plan to allow it to be consistent with the new land areas that are being incorporated. The fourth item is the plan unit development and the site plan amendment, which also includes the two waivers which are on the screen in front of you. Now I want to address public outreach because it's always an important part of our project. And one thing I can tell you is Ms. Booth is very good at public outreach. And I want to walk you through everything that's been done on this. First, there was a preliminary POA meeting held in February of 2020. At that meeting in February of 2020, Anne presented this to the ARC Committee, the Preliminary ARC Committee, and the Preliminary ARC Committee then granted a letter, a preliminary letter, in March 18 of 2020 for this proposal. So that is part of your record. We do have that as part of it. Also, in July of 2020, and sent emails to all of the management companies of the surrounding communities, if that's a requirement. And those of you who live in PGA know that you go through the management companies. You do not go to the board of directors until uh, you're told. You go through the management companies. And then followed up with another email in September of this past year to see if there are any comments. And there had been some comments, and we, had, we have addressed those by email. And then finally, there was a full meeting of the POA on October, or excuse me, not a full meeting, but the POA had an update review of this on October 7th of 2021 because the project had modified. Guess what? We lowered the height of the trellis. We lowered, we did different things throughout the project working through. And then the final ARC, which is the final committee that will approve this, approves it post city council. So we have done outreach to the POA in PGA National. Now, we will continue to meet with them as we know this has been an important topic and I'm happy to meet with anybody out there to explain the project. But I just wanted to be clear that we did do what the process that is in place. So in regards to other matters in front of you, the project was submitted back in November of 2020. The signs have been posted um, in September 27th, 2021. We then had mail notices and a public hearing at your planning and zoning board on October 12th where they approved this. And we also sent notices to the requirement on October 21st of 2021. And here we are today on November 1st requesting your approval. Our whole team is here happy to answer any questions that you may have. And we look
look forward to your, uh, hopefully, your approval this evening. Your staff has recommended approval. Your planning and zoning board had recommended approval. And I want to state again that for the neighbors, we're continuing willing to meet and, and make sure they understand the project. Thank you, and um, I appreciate your time this evening. Ken, can I ask one question? Yes, ma'am, Did of course. any residents show up to the planning and zoning public hearing? Uh, no, ma'am. Thank you. All right. I do have, is there a staff presentation? Good evening. For the record, my name is Samantha Maroney, Senior Planning, City of Palm Beach Gardens Planning and Zoning Department. I have been sworn in. Um, I apologize if this is duplicative, but it is an important project. It's a large project, and so I want to make sure that not only all of you are aware of all the details, um, but the public as well. So um, I'll try and run through some of the, the more simple um, pieces rather quickly. So. Um, as you are aware, the PGA Resort is located centrally within PGA National, surrounded by a golf course um, and many residential communities. There's been a lot of history on this project dating back 1978. The resort itself, um, the PUD, was created in 1980, and since then there have been several amendments to the site plan. Um, all of the facilities and the recreational amenities that are on site today um, were done so through several different amendments through the, the 80s, 90s, um, and the most recent large uh, approval was in 2004. There were several expansions approved to the hotel um, and resort property, most of which were not built, but I'll go into detail on some of those a little bit later. And then as you're aware, in 2018, Brookfield Properties purchased the resort core and the golf courses and they have been looking to make improvements um, to the property since then. So on the left-hand side, you can see in red the boundary of the resort core parcel. The yellow parcels here um, are the three areas that are requested to be incorporated into the resort core. Um, in order to bring those pieces, which total 2.08 acres, into the resort core boundary, there are several different amendments that um, need to be done. Before you tonight um, for your vote is Ordinance 13 and Ordinance 14. Ordinance thir 13 is a small scale land use map amendment for the 2.08 acres um, to bring those from golf to commercial. The purpose is to be consistent with the resort core so that they can be incorporated. The density and intensity of the resort core is being limited with that land use map amendment to the ultimate development program for the site. We did complete a level of service analysis, um, such as traffic, seacoast, water and sewer, solid waste and drainage, as required for comprehensive plan amendments. Um, and this amendment is um, consistent with the city's comprehensive plan. The zoning is very similar, um, again, just to change those three parcel areas from PGA National PCD with underlying golf uses to the hotel and recreational PUD. So a couple of graphics just to um, show you the existing commercial land use for the resort. You can see it is surrounded um, by green currently, which is golf. The addition of the three parcel areas um, will be commercial as well, and still the entire boundary will be surrounded by golf. Same for the zoning, um, PUD in white, surrounded by PCD. Again, these um, amendments, the land use and the zoning, are consistent with the comprehensive plan, particularly the commercial and golf future land use elements, as well as goal 1.1, which ensures a mixture of land uses in the city. Um, as I mentioned, the property existing and proposed will be surrounded by golf. There are also two requests for a PCD amendment and a PUD amendment. The PCD amendment is just an update to the master plan to allow for that change in boundary for the resort core and update the acreage for that parcel. And the PUD amendment is all of the related site plan changes. So um, Ken was very clear on a lot of these items, so I will go through some of the more simple um, items rather quickly and then touch on the lazy river and water slide. I also wanted to note that what's being proposed with this site plan um, are three separate accessory amenities. One, the future golf teaching facility. 
the guardhouse, and the pool buildings, the three pool buildings. Those are all accessory in nature, um, and they do not substantially change the ultimate development program, as you can see on the screen. Um, also, as a matter of the site plan, uh, there was shared parking approved in 2004, and based on a few of the adjustments to the parking lot areas, that shared parking was updated with the PUD amendment. Traffic was reviewed, like I said, with the level of service analysis for the land use, and again, since these uses being proposed are accessory, they are minimal in traffic impact. Looking at the guardhouse, as Ken mentioned, this is informational um, in nature, and the purpose is to greet new hotel guests um, to the property through a formal entry point. Guests can come through um, and members can go around. Whether a fire truck or bus needs to access through the covered area or around, there is um, enough room both in height um, and in width for that access, as well as through the exit lane. The additional pickleball court will match the two existing courts and the removal of the playground is being mitigated by an indoor children's area. The pedestrian gate, as Ken mentioned, is another level of um, access um, and circulation that is being um, more secured. And during events like the Honda Classic, it will be open and manned. Um, but other than that, it will be used by members and their guests um, during open operating hours. The future golf teaching facility, this is one of the areas where the parcel is being expanded. It's approximately 0.56 acre in this area. The applicant is requesting just for the expansion of the boundary in this location um, and the size of the golf teaching facility to be approved um, at 20,000 square feet, likely a two-story building. When they do come through for um, a formal request of this golf teaching facility, it, it will require another process through the city, whatever that may be, whatever that's determined to be, so that we can review site plan, landscape plan, and architectural changes. In front of the members club, you can see on the right-hand side the approved um, circulation, one lane in and one lane out, um, and this is being expanded to two lanes in and one lane out with improved circulation down at the bag drop and valet area, as well as modification of the parking lot to the left. There are existing EV charging stations in those parking spaces and those are being maintained with the reconfiguration. Uh, on the bottom side of the screen here, um, on the south end of the members club, this is another area where the boundary is being expanded by 0 0.02 acres. This is to allow the future expansion of the members club and just like the golf teaching facility, it will require another process for us to review that expansion when they decide to do that. In front of the spa, they're um, incorporating more parking closer to the building, which is, of course, an improvement to that area to um, be more functional. And to the new pool amenity. This is the last area, about 1.5 acres, where the parcel is being expanded. Um, in this area, they are proposing the zero-entry beach slope pool, lazy river, water slides, splash pad, and several accessory buildings. Um, as you can see on the screen here in blue, I highlighted the existing tee boxes and the proposed shift in those tee boxes to allow for this um, PUD boundary. Um, and you can see highlighted in yellow all of the buildings and the structures, which I will touch on specifically. In order to allow for this improvement to be built, the existing golf teaching facility in this location will be demolished and the future location, like I had mentioned, is on the west side of the site. A couple of renderings that Ken went through and described. This is the view from um, the south uh, on the lake looking toward the north. You can see the um, top of the food and beverage building, the restroom building, and the water slide structure. And a view from the east side looking northwest. The hours of the pool, um, like Ken mentioned, will be the same as the existing pool, which will be maintained, and the water slide will be dawn to dusk. Noise levels will be required to, to meet city code standards, just like every other property in the city. This buffer area, um, I want to explain in detail. Um, this is a really important part of the proposal. Um, on the left side of the screen, you can see the water slide tower and the water slides as it trails off of the screen. 
you can see the proposed trees and shrubs surrounding that water slide area. Like Ken mentioned, some of the royal palms, uh, actually six of the royal palms in this area directly around the water slide are relocated mature royal palms. They're 30 to 35 feet clear trunk, 40 to 45 feet total height. So that's a substantial buffer um, with those, those palms alone right from the start. They're also proposing to add these pine trees adjacent to the cart path um, as kind of a mid section, uh, as well as the substantial buffer of about 50 trees closest to the patio homes. The intent of all of this is to help screen that view from the patio homes as we are aware that that is the closest residential community. Um, although, as Ken mentioned, it's a football field away. Um, this buffer on this side here closest to the patio homes boundary consists of several different trees at several different heights, um, as well as palms, shrubs, ground cover, to provide that multi-level screening. On the bottom you can see, hopefully you can see, um, on the right-hand side a small person, regular sized person, um, just looks small, looking toward the water slide. Um, and the water slide on the right-hand side here, this is true to scale um, in terms of its proportion and distance. Uh, and with the proposed landscaping adjacent to the water slide, as well as across the ninth hole here, um, the view is anticipated to be screened. The waiver requests, there are two. One is for the total height of the water slide structure, just to the top of the trellis. As Ken mentioned, the um, water slide platform itself, where you stand, is just under 30 feet, which does meet our code, um, and just the, the three feet, 10 inches top of the trellis is, is beyond the 36 foot height maximum. However, the applicant has justified this waiver through the architectural design of the water slide tower, the landscaping proposed, um, and really this project as a whole. The second waiver is for the setback at the members club. This brings the existing building into compliance and allows for that future expansion to be in line with the current building um, and, and still be in compliance in the, at that time. Looking a little closer at the justification for the water slide structure, on the top here in yellow, you can see the approval in 2004 for an expansion to the hotel. This is the location that it was uh, approved for, and the height was an average height of 39 feet, six inches, three stories. In red is the location and size of the water slide tower. So in height, um, it is comparable to previous approvals. They have also uh, modified the plans substantially based on staff's initial concerns um, as far as the architecture. On the left-hand side, you can see the initial submittal, which is a very industrial open post structure with a green canopy on top, and it sat at 47 feet tall. Through our review process um, and staff's communicated concerns, the applicant worked with us to reduce the height down to 39 feet, 10 inches to the top of the trellis, um, provided a com completely enclosed structure with colors and materials compatible with the new and existing buildings, um, as well as the landscape planters wrapping the staircase, as Ken described, and the rest of the landscaping that I've just um, gone through. I have a similar graphic to Ken showing the distance. Um, I overlaid the site plan so you can see for exact reference um, the size and location of the water slide tower compared to the nearest community, the patio homes. The next um, southern community, Villa de Est, and Diamond Head. These two communities are more than a thousand feet away. Um, the landscaping proposed directly around the water slide tower will help to screen this view um, as well as the distance. Looking a little further, again, the water slide is um, to scale in red and the distance of all of the nearby communities. I wanted to go through in a little bit more depth um, on the community outreach that not only the city staff has pushed for and participated in, um, but that the applicant has uh, really worked hard to make sure that they address. So in February of 2020, we know that the PGA POA Architectural Review Committee, the ARC, issued them preliminary approval on the project scope at that time, um, which was actually a little bit more substantial than what they're proposing now, and certainly the design has improved. In July 2020, uh, this is prior to submitting formally to the city, uh, the applicant contacted representatives of the POA, the Members Club, and HOA community representatives 
that are closest to the PGA Resort um, and could be affected by, by this project. So that included the club cottages, golf villas, and patio homes. Um, November of 2020 is when this project was formally submitted. Uh, and again, it included that 47-foot tall water slide structure. Um, by June 2021, through our review process, and based on our concerns communicated to the applicant, they significantly reduced the height of the water slide structure and improved the design. In July 2021, um, city staff, Natalie and myself, met with POA representatives at City Hall. We provided them with an update of the project and gave them copies of the plans at that time so that they would be um, in the loop and we encouraged dissemination of those plans to um, whoever wanted them. In September of this year, um, before we came before the Planning and Zoning Board, the applicant again contacted the POA and the same HOA communities that were closest to the resort. Um, October 7th, we know that the applicant met with the POA, which included ARC representatives and um, HOA representatives of, of uh, other communities, to go over the changes since they had last been to the POA, which was technically in 2020. So they reviewed all of the updates and the changes, uh, which, as we understand, were well received. Then October 12th, um, last month, the Planning, Zoning, and Appeals Board recommended to approve these four petitions by votes of seven to zero. There was no public comment, um, although the project was publicly noticed as required by our code in the newspaper, sign postings, um, and mailers sent to all property owners within 500 feet of the resort. This project, not only the land use and zoning, but uh, the PCD amendment and the PUD amendment are consistent with our comprehensive plan and our LDRs. Um, the expansion of the resort core is compatible um, just by nature of the existing accommodations of the resort um, and its connection with the golf course. The resort supports the golf course as one of its extended amenities, for sure, and the golf course supports the use of the resort facilities. The two requested waivers are consistent with the existing built conditions of the hotel and resort, as well as previous approvals. Like I mentioned, this project was publicly noticed for PZAB and for this hearing in accordance with our code including sign posting around the resort and at the PGA national entrances, as well as newspaper ad postings and mailed notices. Again, as I mentioned, PZAB did recommend approval seven to zero and staff recommends approval of ordinance 13, 2021 for the future land use map amendment and ordinance 14, 2021 for the rezoning. Council action on the PCD amendment and the PUD amendment, resolution 60 and 61 will be taken at second reading of these two ordinances. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's see. I have one card and it doesn't specify whether it's on ordinance 13 or 14, so I will call Mr. Jim Chisholm to the podium at this time. Is Mr. Chisholm here? Okay. Then I have no other on this does anyone have any questions we'll do questions right now for for ken and natalie then we'll make a motion and bring it back uh, for discussion on the project mark i have a simple question um, when it comes to the pool how do you get from the and i should have looked more carefully from the existing pool to the new pool is there like a pathway or do you have to go like, how do you get from one one to the other Yes, that is a gentle review, too. Mm -hmm. I did. Is there a pathway? No. I can help no, answer that. I'll, I'll show you the graphic um, so that it's visual. On the south side of this new pool amenity area, um, this is an important feature that, that neither of us mentioned, um, but it is on the plans. There is a fire lane that will be um, proposed around the entire amenity area. Um, it will double as a golf cart path. So this path you can see right along the south side here connects to the existing path on the south side of the resort. So that is an option for pedestrians to go from the existing pool to the new pool. Although this area is fenced in, there are gates. Um, or the option is to go inside of the hotel, certainly, and access through this corner here internally to the hotel. Okay. 
I had asked that same question at Agenda Review. How do you get out to the new pool area? So, is that, um, is that advisable to, to have to go through the inside to get back outside with your wet feet? And yeah, I, I, well, yeah, the outside option would be obviously more amenable, but it doesn't seem as that accessible without going on the golf cart pathway, which is where people are driving their golf carts from the resort to the... Plus, it's children on the golf cart path. I'm sorry, I forgot to ask this question yeah, the other that's day. Okay. I apologize. Good, uh, good evening again, Kent. To it, two separate experiences, though. The cross connect's not going to be as much. The idea is the other, the old pool will be more for adults, right? And then the other pool is more for families. So that's it's almost two separate experiences. So you want it to be separated. Well, yeah, yes, but obviously there's still a walking path, the connection, as Samantha indicated, but there's no intent for those to be okay. back and forth. Thank, Thank you. you. Anyone else have a question? I have a couple questions. Will you clarify for me? So the, the letters that go out, the letter was sent to um, the people that were within 500 feet. Were there other letters for uh, tonight or for zoning also, or was that the signage that we rely on for that? The mailer, mailer notice was sent out for um, Planning, Zoning, and Appeals Board, and it was sent out again for this council hearing. Okay. And it will be sent out again for second reading. All right, great. I have a couple more questions then. Mm -hmm. So um, if we weren't building this, what would have been in that place otherwise? We, we touched on it briefly in my agenda review. So if I remember correctly, it was, it was going to be like a big monolithic giant building if it wasn't what we're looking at now? Yes, um, I can show the graphic again, but um, it was approved for three-story hotel expansion um, at an average building height of 39 feet, six inches. Okay, great, thank you. And then um, the, the view, we talked about this a little bit in agenda review as well. Um, I took some time, at the last uh, twice I've been out there to spend some time in the backyard of the patio homes and my only concern was, you know, if we, um, the view from the slide, I understand the view for the residents, but then the view from the slide, it seems like there's enough um, landscaping going in that if I'm a young girl up on the slide, I'm not gonna be able to see into the backyard of the neighbors because it's so far away. And that was a great graphic, thank you, that clarified it. So I'd just like to be clear so our residents understand that. And my last question is, why can't we move the slide? Maybe Ken. Sure, thank you. Thank you. And first thing, kind of following up, uh, the, the football one that I showed you before didn't include any trees, too. So, <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. so it could definitely be a significant uh, blockage. Uh, so let's, let's, I mean, the topic is the noise of the slide. And why can't we relocate the slide? First thing, the most important piece of equipment, which is the mechanical room, is, was placed in the furthest away from the residence all the way to the north. The slide itself was placed on the south, but the slide the slide operates from a time period of to, and it closes every night at dusk. The pool actually is open a bit later. So if you just kind of take a step back and think about how this is gonna work, the pool itself is open later, the slide closes earlier. So in essence, the area around the water slide is actually quieter earlier in the night than the pool itself. So it actually somewhat creates a buffer to the noise that is actually generated from the pool itself to, to the most adjacent neighbors to the south. Thank you. Thank you. Carl, any questions? <clears throat> I actually don't have any questions because that was a lot of information and we've gone over it and we got it twice tonight and all of my questions, I will have a comment when uh, that's time, but I'm good to go with this. Oops. Since Councilmember Tinsley is not here to ask her landscaping questions, I'm going to ask the landscaping That's questions. 20 minutes. Oh no, you don't have to do it. <laughs> and I'm I'm going to base it on the f fact I went out there and actually took some pictures right from the residents' backyard, right across that expanse. What exists there now? comes right up to where that building is going to be demolished, and you can't see through that at all. Is that, is this what is going to continue past? Because if it is, then you will not see anything on the other side of that. I don't know if you want to, yeah, if you can, 
I mean, this is, uh, is this the type of trees and landscaping that is, um, that it, that is proposed? Because it, it's almost a complete barrier. Um, I have a photo, actually. Yeah, that's what that's I, it. That's, that, uh, that's it, yeah. that's it. And the <laughs> only spot right now that has none is where that star is, is where the building is. If that's going to continue past, you can't see anything. Right, so the, in, in that location, that the star is where this amenity is going to be located. Mm -hmm. um, and if we flip back now, knowing that location, um, again, the star on mm -hmm. this side here, you can see that um, the enhanced buffer is being placed on the cart path directly behind that, the pine trees, mm -hmm. as well as substantially closer to the patio homes. Right. So you're going to continue basically that buffer that's there now across where that star is so that the the thing is behind it. Essentially. Essentially, I'll, I'll show more. this here again. So Plus more. Yep. Okay. So this is the um, very thick, very opaque buffer right. from that photo. We're going to be adding pine trees as well as this entire buffer on this side. And those pine trees will do similar to what that very thick buffer has now? I think the combination of, of all three of these areas uh, around the water slide and, okay. and these two areas yeah. would have the same purpose. Sorry, I do have another question. Mark, go ahead. I'm sorry, I did have another question. Um, I know the res this is not up for talk right now, but there was a question from one of the residents about future development of the resort and expansion of the resort. The image that you showed us earlier, original plans, was to carry that resort along the uh, south end of the resort, uh, of the pool area to where the slide is now. Obviously, that you're building this pool and, and, and proposed slide. If and when you ever plan on building beyond and adding those other 81 rooms, is there a, even a suggestion as where they may go, or is that way too premature? Because there was a comment from one of the residents in suggesting it was going in another pathway. And again, I know that's not here, but I'm just kind of curious as to where that may go. Just wanted to make sure there's something I didn't know. We don't know the answer to that today. I mean, PGA National has been around since 1978, and as things change going in the future, when we re when we come back before you for future rooms, if that happens, we will come back before you with a site plan. But honestly, we don't have the answer today. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Ken, boss, don't don't leave yet. Yes, um, can you address the changes to the golf course? There were also suggestions from the residents that there will be more golf carts, more golfers, more balls in the backyard, and I don't believe from what we've seen that there are substantial changes being made to the golf course. First, I think let's address how far the tee box is moving because that's the only thing I believe on the golf course that's actually changing. It's moving six feet. It's not creating a, a major change. You know, I can't hit a golf ball four feet, but I know some of you can hit it a lot further. Uh, so the golf itself isn't changing that much. So there's not going to be more substantial golf balls in people's backyards. There's not going to be additional golf carts. This is actually going to be a destination for people who, with their family, so they actually stay within the resort instead of go out on the roads or, or whatever, that, whatever different. It'll just be something unique, and it'll be a great destination for families. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so can I now get any more questions? We're good. Can I get a motion and a second to approve? I'll make a motion to approve Ordinance 13-2021 on first reading. I'll, I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 4-0. Oh. Yep. Yep. Okay. And then we'll do discussion after Ordinance 14, I guess. Will the clerk please read the title of Ordinance 14, 2021? Ordinance 14, 2021, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, rezoning certain real properties, such property being comprised of 2.08 acres in size, more or less, and located within the PGA National, immediately adjacent to the PGA Resort core at the southern terminating end of Avenue of the Champions, approximately 0 0.50 miles south of PGA Boulevard, providing that these parcels of real property that are more particularly described herein shall be rezoned from planned community development PCD overlay with an underlying golf uses. 
to plan unit development piece, PUD uh, overlay with underlying hotel, recreational, and incidental facilities related thereto, providing that the zoning map of the City of Palm Beach Gardens be amended accordingly, providing a conflicts clause, a severability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date for other purposes. I'm going to open the hearing. This is a quasi-judicial hearing. Are there any ex partes? I spoke briefly with Mr. Tuma on Monday, just that he was calling to let me know he'd be the person presenting. I also spoke with Mr. Tuma on Monday evening. Spoke with Ann Booth months ago, and then again with Ken the other night and just a bunch of residents, and um, that's it. Carl? And I spoke with Ken as well. I have no cards on this unless Mr. Chisholm has returned. So I am going to close the hearing. The presentation has already been completed. Can I get a motion and a second to approve? Can we have some discussion? After we get oh, the motion sorry, sorry. and second. Apologies. I'll make a motion to approve Ordinance 14 2021 on first reading. I'll second. And I will bring it back for discussion. Mark, go ahead. Yeah, um, well, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to, um, I mean, PGA Resort is kind of the centerpiece of our city uh, in a lot of ways. For those of us that live here, it's been here forever, and it, you know, this is the, the golf mecca of, of, of the eastern seaboard. Um, and for those of you that live from outside of the town, you know, you come to PGA and you think of golf, the Honda Classic, and et cetera. I live in PGA National. I've lived there for over 10 years, and I'm a member of the club. So it means a lot to all of us, and three of us up here actually live in PGA National. So I think, you know, we're, we're representing a large swath of our residents and our, and our friends and also ourselves. So I think it's important that we just make sure that everyone understands what this key piece of our city is going to do and where it's going to go over the next few years. I'm thrilled with, with what you've proposed. The resort uh, was getting a little bit old. Um, we have spent many times at that resort. Uh, we have uh, an education seminar with my optometric association. We're going to be there again in February, so very familiar with, with the resort. We have guests that come, uh, other doctors that come to our seminar every February from up north just to play golf, and they pretend they go to class. So, you know, there's, there's a real draw uh, for the PJ National, and I think the changes that you're making are, are going to make it that much better. But, uh, you know, this, this water slide, it does have a little bit of a sore spot for me, and I'll tell you why. Um, we've also spent a lot of time at a number of the Gulf resorts around the South Florida and around the country. We uh, have gone to the Turnberry, and I tried, when I saw this, my first thought was the Turnberry down in Aventura, the JW Marriott. Uh, we've been there for a few events. We're going to have a convention there this summer. It's got the same type of feel. It's obviously much bigger. Uh, it's got two golf courses, world-class courses. It's got this fantastic kids' amenity with the water slides and the lazy river and the pool. Very, very cool. Very, very fun. The difference is there compared to what we're trying to do here at PJ National. Those water slides and that kids' amenity is really far away from the golf, and it's really far away from the resort. It's not it's, it's, uh, so I understand the value of the kids' amenities, and I'm fully supportive of the pool, the, the, the lazy river, everything that you've got there. But it almost looks like that water slide is being shoehorned into a spot that just doesn't seem to fit this spot at this resort. This is a golf resort, and the members and the people that come, the Honda Classic, and I hope that the Hana Classic stays here for years and years and years because it is such a draw and such a positive to our city and to the resort as a whole. But that, that placement of the water slide, although I'm not opposed to a water slide in a kid's amenity, it just doesn't seem to fit there. And the reason is, is that I understand the homes and I get it and I, and I don't disagree with the distance. And, and uh, as a side note, as a funny note, I played golf with a bunch of guys um, in the men's club they didn't know who I was. I didn't know who they were. They were railing on the city about why it was taking so long to get this, this process passed. And I said, okay, let me tell you who I am. Not that it matters that much, but let me just remind you why you live in Palm Beach Gardens, because our residents and our staff and the, and the applicants and the, and, the, and the people that work with the applicants know the city, love the city, work very hard to make this city special. So, you know, after that, they kind of stopped talking. But... Um, <laughs> But back to the point, I mean, these guys play golf a lot, as, as I'd like to try as well, and Carl really tries. 
But uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry, man. I just had to throw that there. Right. Um, but but the water slide. I just think about that. I played the Fazio on Saturday, on, on Sunday, on purpose. I wanted to s just feel it again. I've played it many times. The idea of having a water slide looking down at you when you're on the range, looking over at you when you're on the green, seeing the kids screaming and having a good time on a water slide looking over those, those areas takes away the value and the, 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 the feel of a golf resort first. I don't have a problem with the, the, the pool. I don't think anybody will. But when you think about where that slide is going to be, and if you compare it to other golf and family resorts like the Turnberry, where that amenity is really far away, it just feels like it's being stuffed into a spot that doesn't belong there. So I don't know how the – I mean, I've spoken to my friends and residents and other members too. They've kind of made their comments, and I know Ken worked really hard to talk to them, and I didn't get any feedback from anybody, so thank you for bringing that up. And I'm sure you're going to hear from some of the people that try to play there. But, you know, if I'm coming into town or if I'm going somewhere with my brother and family and friends and we're going to go golf, I would just be a little bit turned off by seeing that. Now, that's not the city's job, and it's not necessarily the county's job to tell you what you can and can't do with your property. you obviously done a ton of studies uh, and have really done the research as to what brings these types of resorts together. But being here, living here, playing there, being there a lot, that spot just doesn't seem to be the place for a water slide. So I don't know how the conversation is going to go over the next month. I'm fully supportive of supporting everything that we're doing here tonight, but I look forward to more conversation as we go forward. Thank you. Carl? <clears throat> Um, well, adding on to what my fellow council member said, I was good with this project right up to the point that you made the Ohio State Buckeye <laughs> field. So I will accept your apology in advance. Hopefully you did not offend your client. you got several FSU stamp people up here. So, all right, so having said that, I have a different spin on it. What we do in Palm Beach Gardens and as a city is we make sure that the people that live here stay here. We build golf courses. We get ingrained with downtown at the gardens, so we have more of a relationship. We build baseball fields. We host World League Baseball for Children. They come as far from Hawaii, I believe, a few years ago. Our soccer fields just hosted uh, some sort of national playoff, or I don't know what the title of it was. And we're also moving forward to building this ice skating rink so it's multi-level use where I'm sure people are going to come from Canada or all over the country to play competitive ice hockey there. So the economic value of improving PGA National to the tune of the first hundred million that I guess they've already spent makes a difference to everybody. And um, it's PGA National because it needs to be a nationally world destination and it's it is I mean it is all about golf we we know that but within you know our city is a family we have children that play soccer we have children that play baseball and we have children that are going to be coming here and it's very likely that they will come here more because of the lazy river the already existing amenities over there, and, and the water slide feature. It, it, it gives these children, the younger children, um, something to do. So I think on a, you know, we're building our new par three. We got a little feedback on that, but we want everybody to, that lives here to stay here. We don't want them to go to North Palm Beach, or we don't want them to go to the Rapids, or, or whatever, the, whatever it is. So the value to me of PGA National being the best that it can possibly be, I think brings value to our entire city. And it's already a great place. And, and I, Mark and I were just talking, when's the lobby gonna be open? <laughs> Soon, or is that not done yet? Okay, sir? Okay, cool. Um, so I think for me on, on a more of a global, uh, a global overview or a global snapshot of what PGA National is doing is really important to everybody that lives here and a lot of people around the country or world and look at all the, the everything you host at PGA National. 
It's important. You know, a lot of, not everybody plays golf. Um, I do have a concern of, uh, this is just myself, the Honda Classic is very dear to our city, probably most everybody in this room. And maybe if there's a way that we can have a conversation about uh, limiting the use of the water slide and maybe the lazy river, because if it's just on the other side of that fence and you're only moving, you know, uh, hole one is there as well as, what, what other holes there, Mark? One and... Oh, no, but the champion's on the other side. It's not on the champion's on the course. Oh, that's right. So that's, that's true. So the only thing is, is, but they do, they do, don't they hit balls there during the Honda Classic as well? Okay, they're at the big one. So anyway, you know, just, you know, if there's any th concerns where we might need to limit the hours for, for whatever reason, I just, you know. Um, but other than that, I like the project. I like everything. I think it's important to the community that PGA National be the best it can be. And I think it, um, because of where our, the direction PG National is going, it brings an economic impact to our community. And that's big to the city council. So thank you. Thank you, Chelsea. Yes, thank you all for your time and for your presentations. And this reminds me a lot of when I first got elected and we had a carousel that came along. <laughs> and I think I'd been in office about three weeks and I got about 60 emails a day about the carousel. Um, it was busy, but at that time, our staff did a beautiful job mitigating it. They did a great job uh, speaking to the folks at the Landmark. They brought all the parties together, and so I have faith that our, our city, our staff, has done a wonderful job doing that again. I, and if you look at the, um, where the carousel is going to be now, everybody is happy. We did it, and I think we'll do it again with this. What I do see missing is that we um, seem to have had a bit of the folks at PGA National not really understanding what was going on. I, 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 I'm so glad we did all that outreach and I'm thankful for all those emails that were sent and the letters that were sent and uh, I would love to see between now at first reading and second reading for any of the residents who don't know to have the opportunity to interact with Mr. Tuma or whomever who they seem like they're more than happy to discuss what's going on. I'd love to see that communication happen because my job, our job here is to make sure our residents are clear about what's happening in their backyard. Now the backyard though, I, I've been out twice to the backyards at the patio homes and when I was there um, on Monday at two, there were 15 people wandering around. There was a guy with a cooler, there was a guy with a tent, and I'm sure there was a tournament or something happening, there's a guy on his cell phone and it's all 10 feet, 15 feet away. So if all this buffering goes in, it's actually going to improve some of the privacy that the folks in the patio homes may not already have. Uh, so the, the things I'm concerned about, again, parallel to the carousel, I do think our staff will pull it through. We do. I think everyone will be happy in the end, as long as that communication take place, takes place. And I want to commend PGA National for investing in our economy and our quality of life. If you look at the Florida scorecard, uh, the chamber shared this, that we need 30,000 jobs by 2030 for our growth, tourism, and quality of life. So thank you for making that happen in a way that brings in families, golf, all the things that people care about. Now, you know, maybe someone who lives in a different municipality doesn't have that on their list of things to do, but we listen to our residents. We do an annual survey every year, and recreation is always at the top, if not number one. So I'm proud of this tonight. I know uh, there's, there's a little bit of what we call NIMBY, not in my backyard for everybody, but I, I do feel like our city has done everything to mitigate that, and um, I look forward to everyone being happy. Thank you. So, Councilmember Marciano has been here 10 years, and I understand his viewpoint um, on golf. However, I've lived as a resident of PGA National for the past 30 years. I can tell you after raising three kids, some of the best memories we have were our weekends at the PGA National Pool. I mean, it was an outing every single weekend. Um, and those were the things that, that brought us together as a family. Um, they would have loved what you're planning to do. They absolutely would have loved it. 
I do want to point out that the other pool area, where, which is the one we went to, of course, I think it's been redone two times since then, um, is closer to a lot of the other patio homes. The, fa the, the resort is not expanding the number of hotel rooms, so the number of families that, that are coming is not going to change. We're shifting the location of where those families may hang out. We haven't had any complaints about noise, kids' noise, music noise, party noise, because of the city's code restrictions on the pool that exists. And I don't expect that we're going to have any on, on this new one either. Uh, it's, the slide will close at dusk, which most of the year is at 5.30 p.m. So the new amenity would definitely shift where they play, but with all of the landscaping, the planners, the concrete nature of it, I don't think anybody's even going to realize that it's there, except maybe the golfers on one hole of an 18-hole golf course. And, I mean, is it worth it to agonize over moving it for one hole of golf when this is, as Carl said, a family resort? We want to encourage families to come, those who play golf to play golf, but we do need to offer other amenities. And not just for people coming in from out of town, but for those residents like me who have memberships at the club and want to bring their kids. Our, our developments are getting younger again. My, my street's getting younger again. And um, they deserve to have the upgraded uh, amenities that we had when we moved here. Um, in, in Palm Beach Gardens, like all other cities, renovation, modernization, and redevelopment have to be at the forefront of everything we plan in order to attract businesses, jobs like Chelsea mentioned, and enable entities like PGA National Resort to remain financially viable and to increase our property values. When the resort does better as homeowners, we all do better. So in this case, the proposed changes to the zoning and plans are, are much needed for a resort that's long been the centerpiece of our community. And I believe that the changes will increase our property values. I think we will be able to work it out, as Chelsea mentioned, uh, with, with our residents when they actually get to see. You hear so much, oh, it's coming, it's a water slide, it's this big, tall thing. But until you actually see what the plans look like and, and put into perspective how far you are, um, I think a lot of residents didn't really get, get the full benefit of, of that until tonight. So uh, with that, we will vote on Ordinance 14, and we will deal with Ordinance 60 and 61, uh, the final approval on the slide at the next meeting. So at this time, uh, we already got a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 4-0. All right. So, will the clerk please read the title for Resolution 55? Resolution 55, 2021, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, approving a site plan for a 27 lot single family subdivision on approximately 26.82 acres within the Panther National Master. Plan Pod 13, located within the residential parcel, Parcel A, of the Avenir Plan Community Development, PCD, that is generally located on the north side of North Lake Boulevard, 
east of Grapeview Boulevard, west of Bay Hill Drive, and south of Beeline Highway is more particularly described herein, provide, providing conditions of approval, providing an effective date, and for other purposes. I'm going to open the hearing. This is a quasi-judicial hearing. Are there any ex partes? I do. Oh, sorry. I spoke with uh, Rosa Schechter. Okay. Nope. I have none. We will ask Vice Mayor Reed when she returns um, at this time. Petitioner presentation. Oh, and the ex parte is on the 27 My homes. No. Okay, on resolution 55. Okay, it's all yours. All right. Good evening, uh, Mayor Litt, Vice Mayor Reed, and Council members. My name is George Missimer here tonight on behalf of the applicant. Uh, before I get started, I'd like to re reiterate your sentiments on football, and I think I heard you mention Florida State, so go Knowles. <laughs> um, so we'll get started. Um, I did see a couple members of our team come in after the uh, swearing-in process, so I don't know if you want to go through that before, just in case any questions are asked, so we don't have to do that after the fact. Have you been sworn in? I've been sworn in. There was a couple of members that came in afterwards, and so I just wanted to get that out of the way in case it comes up in the, the later. Absolutely. I can swear them in right now. All right. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? All righty. Well, I will jump right in. We're here tonight to talk about Panther National, the first uh, two residential pods uh, within the community. So. Uh, our applicant, Avenir Holdings, uh, recently sold the property to Panther National, so that has closed. Our developer, Panther National, our residential architect and uh, kind of master planner for the community is Strange Design. And then our landscape architects, uh, Lucidio and Associates, planners are Kotler and Hearing. And then our civil engineer was Bobby and Associates. So tonight we have two resolutions. We'll do a combined presentation for those. Uh, resolution 55 for pod 13 approving uh, 27 single family homes and then resolution 56 for pod 14 approving 52 single family homes. Uh, we recently received approval for our master plan with resolution 43 which was for the three, total 391 uh, acre community and then resolution 44 approved the golf course site plan and major conditional use. A brief reminder on the location of Panther National, again, west of Beeline Highway, north of North Lake Boulevard, within the Avenir community. Uh, we are in the northwestern portion of the developable area in uh, uh, Avenir, and we are a total of 218 dwelling units as part of that approval. We have two main entrances that are gated, and these are the only gated entrances to the community, uh, so the internal pods will not have separate gates. Uh, the main entrance off of Coconut Boulevard, and then uh, another main entrance off of Spine Road 6. Internal entrances to the pods, uh, you can see with the yellow arrows, again, there are no gates for these entrances. And then we've worked with the city uh, staff and uh, fire department in determining good locations for emergency egress to make sure that we have uh, access to the development. Uh, which connects to the 20-foot fire break on the northern portion of the community. So we'll take a look at those cross sections real quick. Uh, here we have a 40-foot buffer adjacent to that 20-foot fire break easement. Uh, it's not an easement, fire break area. Uh, and we do have a 10-foot overlap. We are proposing a 6-foot concrete wall uh, on the downslope of that berm, which is important because we're trying to maintain those sight lines to that conservation area. So it is a landscaped area. There are no residences or uh, people outside the community there, but we want to make sure that we maintain security uh, as well as visual um, to the conservation area. We do have a water main easement uh, connection to loop pods 13 and 14 together for water quality. And so this section of that northern buffer looks a little different, which has the, the water main as well as that 15-foot SUA easement. Uh, and then a quick detail of that wall and just wanted to point out, since it is on the downslope of that berm, we are providing weep holes at the bottom of that wall to make sure that there's no ponding behind that wall. All of this is consistent with what was approved on the master plan. 
uh, quickly, again, consistent with uh, the master plan approval, our lake interfaces really uh, expanding on that uh, wide open space of that golf course and utilizing that amenity and that view for these homes that are adjacent. Uh, looking at the landscape design, just wanted to touch on that, that formal corridor down the center of the pod with uh, large oak trees. And we've created these landscape focal points, uh, which are doubling as turnaround points for emergency vehicles. Uh, and we, of course, we have uh, our drainage tracks uh, in between lots that are also landscaped. Similar conditions within pod 14 here with landscape focal points as well as our landscape drainage tract areas between the homes. And then the quality of landscape design is something that was really important to the developers in Panther National. Um, so utilizing very large trees, so 22 foot oak trees along the uh, main street here. And then our focal points we're using 25 foot oak trees. So very large material to make sure that it corresponds nicely with these larger home sites. And here's a cross section of that 64-foot right-of-way within pod 13. It's the same condition in pod 14 as well. You can see the residential, uh, the street lights, as well as those large oak trees, uh, and of course, all of the dimensions that you see there. We do have uh, sidewalks on either side of the road uh, to uh, maintain good pedestrian access throughout the community. And here is a quick view of our uh, street lights. A uh, very modern design fitting with the architecture, and we have matched a bollard light, as you can see on the screen, which is located next to the mail kiosk areas, which you'll see in a minute. Touching on the landscape design, again, very similar to what was approved with the master plan, a heavy native palette corresponding with the adjacent conservation area, and as well aiding in that sustainable element of the design to make sure that we're limiting our irrigation usage. Here are some conceptual renderings that we showed you for the master plan showing that landscaping. Uh, this is at the entrance of pod 14. Just to, again, uh, give you that feel and what we're visualizing for this community to look like. Now, I did mention that these are the larger home sites in Panther National. These are half acre and one acre lots within pods 13 and 14. Uh, so the setbacks and all of the development regulations are within our pattern book, which Scott Hedge will go over in a minute but much larger setbacks than what's uh, approved for other communities in Avenir, simply um, because of the, the larger home sites. So looking into site design, we'll start on pod 13. Uh, we do have 27 total lots, 15 half acre lots, which are all on the conservation area to the north, and 15 one acre lots facing the golf course to the south. Our total acreage, again, 26.82 acres. Uh, we do have uh, three and a quarter acres of common area landscape, uh, and our gross lot area for everything is about 20 acres. The six-foot wall in that uh, detail that we showed you earlier is along the northern perimeter inside that 40-foot landscape buffer and is adjacent to the 20-foot fire break. And this is the location where that SUA easement comes into the community, and again, we have a 64-foot right-of-way. Our mail kiosk is located at the entrance to the pod inside this large open space, uh, and we've designed this mail kiosk to be somewhat of a gateway to this open space and then further connection to the conservation area to the north. Uh, so we'll show you a rendering of that mail kiosk. This is the larger mail kiosk in the community uh, in its scale because of the large open space that it's within. Uh, so very modern design, uh, very consistent with what we've proposed for the guard houses, uh, as well as what you'll see for the uh, pattern book in those um, homes. And here's another angle of that. Again, you can see the use of natural materials to really accentuate that architecture. Moving to pod 14, we have 52 uh, single family homes in pod 14, 43 half acre lots, and nine one-acre lots. Skip over the acreages. Uh, again, consistent with pod 13, the six-foot wall along the northern perimeter inside the 40-foot buffer, 20-foot fire break, uh, and the SUA easement crosses on the western corner of this pod. We do have the 64-foot right-of-way as well as a section that is 56 feet. 
And uh, just a quick note, adjacent to lot 52, we have provided an eight foot wall uh, that is the uh, furthest point on the community closest to Coconut Boulevard. So just some additional protection. There's landscaping as well uh, that we've provided for that, for that lot alone. We also have a mail kiosk within uh, pod 14 as well as a separate uh, fire break access uh, to the north. And so we'll take a clo closer look at that. There is a 14 foot concrete uh, drive as well as 20 foot overall stabilized, stabilized area as well as a golf cart parking area and some other amenities for the community to be able to access that conservation area. And then the mail kiosk located adjacent to that, and it's inside of a smaller open space, so we've decreased the scale a little bit, uh, and it's still provided nice landscaping around it. Here is a quick rendering of what that mail kiosk looks like. So that brings us to the pattern book, which Scott Hedge will walk you through, which really goes over all of the architectural intent and really guides developer, the developer and residential home buyers to what we envision this community to be. Yeah, good evening. My name is Scott Hedge. I'm with uh, Panther National, and I have been sworn in earlier. Um, Madam Mayor and uh, City Council, I'd just like to, <clears throat> first of all, uh, say thank you for allowing us to be here. I, I don't see my friends from Landstar here tonight, which means that officially we have closed, so we are now on our own. <laughs> but um, no, we're very, we're very excited um, to, to get over that threshold. We've been working very hard on this project uh, with your staff, with everybody, to make this a reality, and we're one step closer to doing that, so we're very proud to be here tonight. Um, I wanted to uh, walk you through very quickly our um, pattern book, which really establishes the uh, architectural character which we had uh, presented to you in our master plan and some of the elements that you saw there, which will guide us through the, um, the designs for the homes within Panther National, um, not only for these two, but also for uh, pod 12, which is um, the one third acre lots. We're finalizing that application um, with staff as we speak and should be bringing that to you uh, very shortly. Um, these, uh, the pattern book in itself really talks about the different applications of, of setbacks, of, um, of different uses, et cetera, typical to the zoning, and we've uh, increased our setbacks and the regulations in accordance with the size of the lots that we have for the half-acre lots as well as the one-acre lots. Um, but there's really more of a pictorial guide, if you will, to make it very user-friendly uh, to design homes and make sure that we are delivering the type of architecture and the vision that Panther National uh, will be. It's a it's first of its kind modern and contemporary uh, gated uh, private community, golf community. And uh, Max Strang, who is uh, from the Sarasota School, by the way, he will be making a presentation on the 11th at the Breakers for the local AIA chapter, if anybody's interested. Um, he is doing a presentation on uh, his architecture and his work. It's, it's uh, very well known in the state of Florida as well as architectural communities and his style is not only from uh, residential but from the community amenities will really set us um, apart from what you would see in most of the other uh, communities. Our design guidelines are very simple. It talks about um, building heights, um, accessory structures, the type of uh, roof lines, uh, the type of fences and walls, fenestration materials, most of the materials and the, the prescriptive um, elements within our pattern book are um, natural materials, wood, stone, um, obviously the use of stucco in various ways. Um, even the use of stone, that being smooth and or textured, will deliver different typologies of um, elevations and themes. These are all dictated very simply in terms of illustrating for the user what is acceptable or what is um, permitted and then more importantly what is not. As an example on roof lines we're not permitting um, barrel tile roofs or metal roofs that's not um, within the character and the style that we are proposing for Panther National. So as you pick up this pattern book you'll see very simply what it is that we are looking for and how to design your homes with a kit of parts that are defined in our um, materials as well as the um, enclosures, if you will. 
So um, we, we had a lot of discussion at the last meeting about uh, screen enclosures. Our designs will integrate screen enclosures into the architecture and into the homes. And as you see here, what would not be permitted is a larger external screen enclosures that you would normally see in a smaller home, if you will. Most of these homes are going to be larger. They won't have a lot of that because of the way that the landscaping is incorporated anyways, and we feel that designing these homes to include those elements within them are going to make the homes that much more interesting and that much more um, unique as, they, as you see them not only from the home side but from the golf course side. Um, we define garages, driveways, the type of material, um, pavers, no, um, tabby, concrete, yes. It's um, consistent with the landscaping themes as well as the architectural themes and the use of natural materials. Fences, walls, gates, again, um, our uh, pattern book is really a pictorial guide for everybody as we design our homes and we bring them to staff and to the building department uh, to review. And if you are somewhat um, unable to develop a home within all of those guidelines, what we've also included is illustrations of what we know we do not want to make it very easy for somebody to be able to pick up this book and say Panther National is in fact a unique uh, development and we're not going to be looking at um, a Mediterranean or colonial home within our, within our patterns. So. Um, with that, I think we're very excited to be here. Like I said, we're, we're starting our, our hard work. We're looking to do pre-apps on our clubhouse. We're working very hard to come before you with all of these pieces and get in the ground and, and be a part of uh, Palm Beach Gardens. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a staff presentation? Madam Mayor, uh, staff presentation must be repetitive, so no presentation tonight. Okay. So let's do what we did before, ask questions now, then we'll uh, get a motion a second and bring it back for discussion. Any questions? So what's the timeline that you expect to start? Uh, we, I don't know if I need to spank the mic, but we started. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, we've already submitted for engineering permits for the main roadways coming in there. Um, we have started our Platts and Civil Engineering for all of the pods that you see. Um, so we, we plan on having um, most of the earthwork and infrastructure started probably early February. So we'd like to get uh, homes, models, uh, you know, started in construction towards the middle of the year, if not sooner. I mean, we're doing everything we can to get our permitting through Seacoast, which seems to be our biggest hurdle to get through as quickly as possible. So Don't blame the city. Don't blame the city. I, did, I didn't say the city, Doug. And you're lucky. <laughs> and you're lucky you're not asking the county for anything. Yeah. <laughs> this is true. That's why we're here. So, but we are. We're fast tracking everything that we can to try to get out there. Um, we know how well Avenir is doing in in general. So we'd like to join the party. And is the golf course coming before or after the homes? The golf course is starting now. Okay. So th that is part of the first uh, the first push. The golf course is not waiting for home sales. The golf course will be started construction this year. 22, excuse me. Being that the golf course will be for residents of Panther National only, how, if you are, will and, it be used before? I and mean, members, no. yes. And we members, will, we okay. We will have some, we will have a handful of outside members. Okay. And um, we'll have people there that either be from within the U.S. or from out of the U.S. And we'll probably initiate some memberships that might be recallable as we go down the future in order to go ahead and initiate play on the golf course itself because we hope to have the golf course ready by the end of the year. Does any of those outside memberships uh, resemble anybody on this side of the <laughs> dais here? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> any other questions? I think Marcy has Marcy, a couple and I just, couple I just have one. Um, can you just go through the process for just, I always like to make things clear, and we talked about it a little bit at my agenda review, but the process for submittal, um, the AARB, et cetera, for the homeowners? Well, um, my understanding um, from the city. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thanks, Brad. You're welcome. Ah, okay. Yeah. 
So the pattern book does include a design review checklist of all of the elements that we've defined within it, and we will internally review and uh, make sure that all of the designs are meet the checklist prior to any submittals to the city. And my understanding is the city then looks at that checklist and also goes back to the pattern book to make sure we're consistent before issuing any permits. Thank you. Mars? So actually you, a you asked one of my questions which was in regards to the membership of the golf and you did mention that there were outside uh, members. So I guess, are you, do you have an idea now as to how many outside members you'll have and uh, how that kind of works, uh, how many you might anticipate having? Well, we're still working on the, on the structure, but we're, we're looking at approximately 300 in total. So it won't be a very large membership in terms of uh, the private club. Um, in terms of how many outside, we don't, we don't have those uh, figured out yet. We're still working through all of the docs and, and how we're going to allocate those. But like I said, we do anticipate having some outside the gate members at the club. Okay, that was good. And actually what I learned uh, from staff, which I was very, uh, it was very interesting to me, which is uh, golf. I was concerned about, you know, traffic, you know, having outside members and traffic versus internal capture of that. But it's based on the number of holes, not uh, the number of members. So that actually was uh, a lot different than I anticipated. But since uh, Chelsea, uh, brought this up, I do want to say that I, uh, having been on the ARC committee for my community for seven years and also a board member, I really applaud your efforts in regards to this. I love this book and I think every community now should have this. I think you set a precedent. <laughs> um, it's, uh -oh. it's amazing. <laughs> uh, and I also applaud your, uh, your native palette and your hardscape features as well. So I appreciate that and making it easy for staff and also for communities going forward, um, your community in particular, it's, um, it's great to see and I appreciate that very much. Um, I just had had one when I had asked staff at my agenda review how many parking spaces there would be for the mail kiosk. They said that every home would be coming with a golf cart. Uh, what other amenities are specific that every home has to have, needs to have? Well, um, we are going to outfit houses with golf carts because we think that it's obviously something that Avenir has built into their community and we really like to take advantage of being at the very north end and being able to get into the town center and all the things that they've built into their infrastructure. It also works within the golf course community as well, so we think that's a benefit. Um, we're still working through the, um, the optionality or the uh, inclusion of the whole Tesla system that you may or may not have heard of, so we're still working through that and the logistics relative to that, so that might be something that becomes a, an element within our homes. We're still you know, trying to work through the pricing, et cetera. But we think that this is going to be a new, you know, prototype for the community, and uh, it's something that we're looking very hard at. Very exciting from the sustainability standpoint, for sure. Um, one question about the wall. There's a six-foot wall around the back, but homeowners also, they're required to put in the fencing, the aluminum fencing, or the black aluminum fencing is optional for the homeowner? Yeah, it, it is optional. The reason why we're putting that wall there, obviously, is the conservation area is completely open to the public. Um, so we do want to make sure that we have security. But well, we've de designed it in such a way that from the residential side, it's still only a four-foot um, height, and the typical fence around your pool is a little bit higher than four feet from a security standpoint. So we're kind of working it in from that standpoint. Um, landscaping will be there so the wall somewhat disappears. And you will have the ability to put a secondary fence if you're not able to get your uh, side yard fences all the way through or across to where the, where the downside mm -hmm. of, that, of that wall is to keep your dogs in and things like that. So the houses, that back, the houses that back up to the yes. preserve are almost like the preserve is their backyard. They're Absolutely. not going to know any different. The wall's not going to be there. Okay, great. Right. I do have one more question then. Is that if that's okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So by talking about the golf carts, you got me thinking. So I, I think Avenir's capture rate was supposed to be 44%. Um, so when we start talking about mitigating traffic, since they, this is a development that'll be at the end of Avenir, 
and we're somewhat close to the airport where we just extended the runway and we're working on coconut. Can you talk a little bit about some of the other transportation efforts so people understand? And this is going to, I can't believe I'm gonna say this out loud. This is like a Jetsons question. So when we were at the League of Cities, um, we were presented about the Lilium, which is the electronic air flight and things like that. And it's pretty cool because it's a commuter electric jet that they're actually putting in at Palm Beach International Airport as well. So super quiet. It's very quiet. It's um, and I, how many how many people were in it? Eight. Uh, yeah, up eight, to eight. Up to eight Pretty people, quiet. including a pilot. So I don't know. Maybe as you're thinking about Tesla and all this forward thinking, because it's a forward thinking city that you're working with. Maybe that's something that we can look into since Avenir will be developing for a long period of time. You know, one of the things that we talked about because we do love the proximity to the airport the North County Airport and the proximity, whether that be a helipad or something that has a direct tie into the club and their mm -hmm. golf course and landing areas and things that really enhance the quality of that interaction with the um, North County Airport, the things that we've spoken about internally, um, the kind of, uh, of uh, transportation you're talking about, you know, who knows, I haven't really. It's, um, a, it's called a vertiport. That, it's the coolest thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. So those are obviously things that we're looking well beyond just, you know, building the homes in the community and things that really set us apart um, are all of the elements that our team is working on on a daily basis. Anything we can do to improve safety and decrease traffic on North Lake Boulevard will be appreciated. Yeah, well, and we feel that coconut going through to the B line is really our front door. Okay. So mm -hmm. Keep saying that. I like uh -huh. that. Good answer. Okay. <laughs> what what uh, <laughs> Councilmember Reed was talking about is it is a separator for sure, and it's something that would be a, a, an excellent element at the North County Airport, a hub there as well for uh, alleviating traffic in uh, a very thoughtful way. And one other comment, which was um, in regards to your utility easements, I thought it was very interesting how you uh, put landscape, uh, you bounded the utility easement with landscape buffer, a, a small shrub, uh, which to me was a pretty thoughtful reminder that this is not your property and uh, it's also a security, a thoughtful way to deal with security as well. So I thought that was pretty clever. Okay, we're all, anybody else questions? We're good? All right, so I need a motion and a second to approve. I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second. I will now bring it back for discussion. None. Any additional discussion on this? No, I think it's good. Yeah. I, thought, I thought, Marcy, you were going to talk about the fire break and the safety of that and how impressive it was. Do you want to? Yeah. I'm, I'm setting you up if you want it. I said all the. All right, I think we're good. Yeah. Okay. No, it's de it's definitely a new addition to to Palm Beach Gardens, something that we have not seen before, and uh, a great addition at that. So, all right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes five zero. Will the clerk please read the title for Resolution 56? Resolution 56, 2021, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, approving a site plan for a 52-lot single-family subdivision on approximately 41.68 acres within the Panther National Master Plan Pod 14, located within the residential parcel, Parcel A of the Avenir Plan Community Development, PCD, that is generally located on the north side of North Lake Boulevard, east of Great View Boulevard, west of Bay Hill Drive, and south of Beeline Highway is more particularly described herein, providing conditions of approval, providing an effective date for other purposes. I'm going to open the hearing. It is quasi-judicial. Any ex partes on Resolution 56? Nope. S yeah. Same as 55. None for me. Okay. Petitioner presentation. It was the same. It was the same we're we're, okay. we're using this. I, yeah, I was sorry. thinking yeah. that it was going to be some. Okay, so we have the same presentation. Um, I have no cards on this, so I will close the hearing. Can I get a motion and a second to approve? I'll make a motion on Resolution 56 2021 that we approve. I'll second. I'll bring it back for discussion. Is there any further discussion? No, I'll, this is I'll just include my comments 
from last one into this one to make a brief. The, the same, it's, it's pretty much the same on the, on the other side. So anything, Carl and Mark? No, I'm, I'm really good. Okay. Uh, all in favor. <laughs> Aye. Pass this Aye. bedtime. All, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes 5-0. Is there a game tonight? Yes. yes. Well, it's only the Jets. Forget it. <laughs> Will the clerk please read the title for Resolution 62? Resolution 62, 2021, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, approving an amendment to the PGA Station Plan Unit Development, PUD, formerly known as Parcel 5B, to modify the uses of pods B and C, including a new eight-story, 396-unit multifamily building, with the parking garage on pod B, modify building nine on pod B, and revise pod C to include a new 200,000 square foot, eight story office building with a separate parking garage that includes 7,049 square feet of retail space along the north and west facades at the parking garage. The PGA station pod is approximately 30.03 acres and is generally located at the southeast corner of PGA Boulevard and RCA Boulevard, as more particularly described herein, providing conditions of approval, providing waivers, providing an effective date, and for other purposes. Well, good evening. I'm going to open the hearing. Are there any ex partes on Resolution 62? I didn't speak with anyone. I spoke with a lot. So you, oh. Of of yeah. Other when, than when residents, guys, who who did you speak with? Well, you guys. Okay, yeah, so I'm first off, I had an uh, this my my meetings on this particular building because of what it is to us and the communities go back a long way. So I've had a meeting with Joey Eichner many months ago. Then I had a meeting with Dan Catafumo and Joey at the same time. Then I had a meeting with Todd. Is it Fabrini or Fab? Fab, uh, okay. Um, and then I had a telephone conversation with Dan in the last week. So that's my quasi on this particular issue. Okay, Mark? Yeah, I had talked to uh, Joey Eichner about eight or nine months ago, and then again um, a couple weeks ago briefly at the chamber breakfast, and I had an um, off-the-cuff conversation with Dan Cataflum at that same breakfast last week. Thanks. I have none. Nobody called me. <laughs> I uh, briefly spoke with Joey Eichner at a uh, corridor event. Okay. Mr. Hearing. Well, good evening, Madam Mayor and uh, council members. For the record, Donaldson Hearing, and I have been sworn, and with me uh, also from Kotler and Hearing is George Missimer, who will be making the presentation because he will be much shorter than I would otherwise be. But I did want to say that we're really excited about PGA Station. Uh, to me, I've known this as Parcel 5B since 1999, and have worked on this parcel for over 20 years, and it's been such an honor and pleasure to see it really evolve to something really special, something that's going to be a part of the city, the core of the city, that's going to continue to promote mobility with FPNL coming, you know, coming out of the ground and hopefully opening up soon. This project and and the workplace activities that are occurring here, that have been built with TBC, with Tire Kingdom, with the Brock's Hotel, uh, it really is world class, and it's been exciting to be a part of the project. Uh, and we certainly will be available to answer any of your questions. Our whole development team is here, uh, and but I'll let you go ahead, George, uh, uh, share with you. He's worked on it for three years, George. I, I've worked on it for 20. So, uh, but uh, he has a lot of information to share. Take it away, George. Thank you, sir. Good evening, again, George Missimer with Kotler and Hearing here on behalf of the applicant, and I have been sworn in. Uh, so again, our, our many members of our team are here tonight. Uh, the applicant and the owners of the properties, PGA Building 6 and Building 9, uh, Catafumo property uh, companies and his partners uh, have done a great job with this development since they uh, repurchased it, bringing Building 4 uh, to life and bringing in uh, many more uh, tenants to the site and pushing forward for this amendment. Uh, they partnered with the Richmond Group for the residential portion uh, for many reasons, uh, mainly the quality of their developments, the attention to detail, and the fact that they design, construct, and manage their own properties. They don't 
build it and sell it to another person to manage. So it, it means a lot to them. They're a life partner on this project. Our architects, Spina O'Rourke and partners designing the uh, office and commercial portions, and then Corwell Architects designing the residential. Uh, they also designed uh, the Solera project in Palm Beach Gardens. Uh, Kotler and Hearing, we are the landscape architects and planners for the project, and our civil engineer, Simmons and White. Uh, Kimley Horn also was our traffic engineer for the project. A summary of our request, uh, we are bringing in 396-unit uh, apartment-style residential building. Uh, we are proposing 10% of those units to be workforce housing. Uh, we are proposing a 200,000 square foot office building in pod C, as well as a detached 998 uh, space parking garage with liner retail totaling about 7,000 square feet. Uh, and we are proposing to update the existing architecture of building nine, which lies between those two buildings uh, and currently is not consistent architecturally. So we wanna update that to make sure that it matches the new buildings. Now I wanted to start with this this is our, our 3D rendering, highly accurate as far as landscaping to uh, bring this together as the full vision. This is what we are aiming to do. This is what we've uh, worked so hard with city staff to uh, come to this final product uh, in creating this, this great new addition to the city, which is both supported and, and benefited by all the city mobility goals and uh, things that have been done in the city to increase um, mobility and connectivity within this transit-oriented development district that has been created. Moving through, as Don noted, there is an extensive that goes back more than 20 years. Uh, suffice it to say that there's been a great evolution uh, throughout the life of the project, bringing in new uses, uh, many changes, all for the better, and we feel that this latest addition to the development is a great step forward in, in providing more sustainability, increased mixed uses, uh, and really benefiting the city. I wanted to talk briefly about the comprehensive plan uh, for the establishment of the transit-oriented development district, which this property lies within, and some of those policies that the city has uh, set out uh, prior to this development and with this development in mind. So uh, generally, located within a half mile of that planned uh, rail transit station, providing a mixture of uses, both retail, personal services, office, hotel, uh, and residential, providing interesting and enticing public gathering places, having comfortable outdoor activity and weather protection, and then promoting uh, energy efficient land use patterns and reducing greenhouse gases with sustainable elements. So pointing out some of those features, uh, highlighting the location of that rail transit station very close in proximity to the project. Uh, we have a, a mixture of uses, hitting almost every one of them in the list, a hotel, medical office, office, residential, and retail. And then providing those interesting public gathering places to activate the street uh, and really uh, promote that outdoor activity, as well as providing weather, and weather covering uh, so looking at sustainability, while these buildings have not been designed to meet LEED standards or green standards, we are in integrating a lot of the elements that they look for. Uh, so more specifically, uh, high efficiency windows, utilizing um, precast concrete materials, in, uh, electric vehicle charging stations, uh, if high efficiency restroom uh, fixtures, uh, and automatic light sensors in the buildings and in the parking garages but looking more broadly too, providing again that mixture of uses, uh, the building massing, bringing in that extra density uh, and supporting uh, uh, walkability and, and connectivity with the rest of the city in this heart of the TOD district. Uh, so zooming out the project location in the center of the city, uh, just south of PJ Boulevard, uh, east of I-95 and just on the west side of alternate A1A. So up until a few months ago, this was what the existing condition of the project looked like. Uh, you see building 10 there, the 80,000 square foot office building uh, has been demolished. So that commitment has been made by, Catafuma, by Mr. Catafumo and his partners to remove that building to make way for the residential as soon as we possibly can. Uh, and then here, I just wanted to highlight, this is the existing approved site plan for PJ Station. 
uh, showing two 64,000 square foot buildings in pod C separated by a parking garage. And this didn't facilitate uh, as much the location of the rail transit station and uh, increasing the benefit of having that station next to this development. And then again, to highlight the proposed site plan, uh, highlighting the location of the residential units adjacent to uh, all the other uses as well as the location of the new office building and parking garage, uh, providing a, a stronger view corridor to that tra transit station uh, and being more connected to that. So in the future, we could have that uh, benefit. Looking briefly at the changes in used square footages that we're proposing with this project, uh, the black numbers representing the new totals for each use and the red representing the difference between the previous approved plan. So looking through professional medical and shopping center retail and restaurant, it's essentially a wash of square footages from what was previously approved. Uh, the main increase in, in density coming with the residential units in, in the new building 10. So our new total required parking spaces is 2,518 and at build out we will have um, 2,643. So more than enough parking for the entire development without the use of shared parking. Uh, and this was intentional in the fact that we're trying to uh, set up the uh, benefit of that rail transit station and providing some additional parking so that uh, when that station comes in, uh, right from the get-go, we have some additional parking. Well, it most likely will not be enough to fully support that station. We're trying to provide that further incentive that we are ready for it. And we do have some opportunities to provide more parking within our Pod C garage should that uh, come to pass. And we'll go over that a little bit later. We did work with staff on the phasing of the project. With uh, ex an existing development, obviously it's important to understand what's gonna come first, where's your lay down area and those sort of elements. So <clears throat> our primary strategy right now is for the residential units to be constructed first, utilizing the vacant pod C property as the lay down area. So that benefits the entire development, it's not disruptive uh, to the greatest extent possible. And just wanted to quickly direct you to the green areas uh, which is our phase one to make way for that first residential construction, and that is currently underway. The lake expansion is actually um, substantially complete, and the uh, ingress-egress adjustment between buildings 11 and 11A is underway as well. And here are some photos of that, just quickly to show you how we've been making progress to make sure that we can make this project a reality. We have worked with staff to come up with the design guideline document for this development, which acts as our zoning code. With all the various overlays in the new TOD district, there is not a specific zoning code that applies to this property. So this uh, combines a lot of the different code sections already in place within the city to provide that standard to make sure that uh, we're doing the, the best that we can. And it improves upon some of the code section, providing some additional elements to be provided. And we talk and talk about connectivity and, and pedestrian walkability. And so I wanted to show this graphic showing the vehicular access points as well as the pedestrian access points. So um, with con connectivity, such a, a large factor in a development of uh, this density in this location, making sure that both internally we have enough connectivity between buildings and uses as well as externally to the outside to make sure that we're, um, again, connecting to surrounding properties to the north and to the south. And looking at some of those uh, main passageways, looking at RCA Boulevard, again, this is an existing platted roadway, but we are making some improvements. Um, so the roadway itself remaining consistent with its existing uh, conditions with bike lanes, uh, the two-way travel with the center median. We are proposing eight, at least eight foot sidewalks on both sides. And actually in this section, you can't really see it, but on the east side next to the office building, we are at nine feet. And then another cross section just to the south, a little bit closer up, you can see uh, that, that pedestrian walkability and with those uh, amenities that we're trying to incorporate to really make sure that this development uh, functions properly. We do have several waivers requested with this proposal, total of six, uh, all supported except for 
uh, waiver number three, and we'll go through each of them re real briefly. Uh, waiver number one is for one additional principal tenant or building ID sign on building six, our large office building. Uh, so these signs are proposed on the west, north, and east elevations, so respectively facing I-95, PJ Boulevard, and alternate A1A. So the second waiver is for two residential ID signs on the residential building. Current codes do not permit signage on residential apartment buildings. As I discussed previously with the Richmond Group, uh, designing, constructing, and managing their properties, it's a significant portion or our, our interest to them in having signage in their tenant recruitment, especially in a high traffic area. And then we are proposing two project ID signs on the parking structure in pot C. These are not intended as tenant signage. It's intended to identify the project and set the stage for the future rail transit station. Our waiver number four is for a small section, about 240 feet of our eastern buffer, which is adjacent to the FEC right of way. Uh, where we have a number of existing utility easements and utilities that are encumbering our landscape buffer. And then number, waiver number five is for the utilization of the Urban Land Institute methodology for shared parking, which is uh, consistent with other waivers that has been approved in the city. It's just a more precise hour by hour breakdown of shared parking. And then finally, to allow 23 compact parking spaces within the parking structures, so respectively six within pod C garage and 17 within the residential garage. So we'll look closely at some of the site details for pod C and then later we'll go to pod B. So starting at the north, we have uh, had to design a new lift station for the development. Uh, we do have an existing lift station in this location, but it's not uh, sufficient to provide for the new uh, residential units. So we've uh, increased the size and we've had to design it to new specifications from Seacoast. So you'll notice that there's no longer a access onto RCA for Seacoast. They actually have a full loop, an access easement to bring in their larger vehicles to service this lift station, as well as there's room for a generator in the case of a power outage. This is also the location of our waiver for the buffer. You'll see these are the existing utilities and utility easements that run adjacent to this area. So we have provided ground covers and shrubs in this buffer location, but trees, we just couldn't fit in the area. But we have provided an additional island next to the lift station to help screen that area, as well as provided an artificial green wall on the actual fencing of the lift station for further screening. As well as we've designed very uh, intentionally the landscape around the generator building. As you'll see from this rendering, the architecture of that generator building is uh, rather enhanced, very modern, very consistent with what we're proposing on the office building, which you'll see in a moment. So I spoke earlier about how the existing site plan didn't really correspond as much to the location of that rail transit station. So something that we really wanted to ensure is you know, we're creating a gateway to the city in this location in the eventuality that a station comes to this location. So providing that visual corridor from both the station out and from uh, people coming to the station in uh, bookended by our public art features, which we're proposing. We do have an art and public places application under review, which we hope to bring uh, before the board soon. And then further looking at the circulation of the site. So. <coughs> In the event that a station comes, we have designed the north loop, which we just went over, to uh, act as that dedicated drop-off area for the station for uh, either a bus shelter or for rideshare facilities. And we have the ability to provide a covered path from that loop to the train station so we could redirect a lot of that traffic. But beyond that, making sure that this section works, making sure that our circulation in the garage uh, was very efficient and very logical for people driving in. Finding the ramp, navigating their way up, either out back to RCA or back around and looping again. We have proposed uh, several rideshare drop-off areas in front of all the new buildings, something that was very intentional in making sure that those facilities would have an area that they could go rather than just pull, stopping on the side of the street and letting someone off, they could pull off and allow someone to exit the vehicle safely. Now, pedestrian circulation. 
from the garage, something very important. We wanted, we couldn't provide a bridge, a sky bridge, if you will, between the various office buildings, but we wanted to integrate a covered passageway. And we've uh, integrated this artistic covered way from the garage to both building six and building nine, as well as in front of the retail portion of the garage. And we've integrated a additional elevator in the northeast corner of the garage. Uh, and this is done, it's not needed at this time, but again, looking forward to the future, if a rail transit station comes, providing that efficient access from the garage to the elevator down, they don't have to cross any drive aisles and they can get right on the train. Uh, if they were to try to do this later, it just wouldn't be possible to add another elevator if we design this garage without it now. And then integrating amenity areas adjacent to the lake. Amenitizing that lake is, is a really important feature uh, to, this, to this pod. So here you can see a cross section of what that looks like with a pathway uh, adjacent to the retaining wall with a railing, nice landscaping and benches, and there's even a covered trellis at the end looking out over the lake. And of course, pedestrian plazas everywhere with lots of integrated landscaping that's all been designed to uh, articulate the building, accentuate that architecture which has been so carefully designed. So here we are back at our full vision of what this looks like. And then here is that corridor, that view looking straight down Design Center Drive towards Pod C uh, in that gateway that we've worked so hard to create. This is a view of the north side of Building 6. Uh, you can see that contemporary styling with the horizontal and vertical mullions integrated in that large floating element uh, on, the, on the right side. And in the foreground, uh, that generator building almost disappears. It's, it's hard to pick up uh, in some of these angles, but uh, very thoughtfully designed to that being intentionally to where you don't have to have a wall of shrub to hide it. It'll, it'll disappear by itself because it's been thoughtfully designed. And this is a very conceptual rendering of what a train station could look like if it was designed by our, our world-class architects. But uh, this just goes to show we have had several meetings with TriRail, with Brightline, to ensure that their needs of their facility could be met and that what we were doing now didn't preclude the possibility of them coming in the future. And they were very pleased with everything that we were able to provide. And here's just an additional uh, image from underneath one of those p pedestrian crossings, looking at all that nice landscaping adjacent to the south entrance of Building 6. Now, internally, there's something very unique to some of the, the newer pedestrian or new office buildings. We do not have any interior support columns within this building, and that's something that's been accomplished through the use of precast concrete materials, such as uh, the concrete double T's. We do have a central access corridor uh, with the centralization of the bathroom facilities and the elevator bank, which really provides the maximum flexibility for tenants to come in and build out their space, something very attractive to the higher quality uh, Class A office users that we're trying to bring to the city. Now on the ground floor specifically, we have also uh, tried to focus on the adaptive reuse of these buildings. So one feature is we've provided additional access points. They may not be used right away, um, but we're providing that possibility to where when a train station comes or market changes, we can provide a different retail use potentially um, if a traffic study is provided to make sure that you know, we can adaptively reuse this building and make sure we're um, fully meeting the needs of the development as well as a potential station that if it came. Looking, here's some of the 2D elevations of that architecture again, looking at that contemporary design. And I'll be showing you the northwest and east elevations specifically so you can see the locations of those three signs that we're requesting on this building. Again, two are permitted and we're requesting for one additional. So this is the north. Here's the west. And then the east. So the north faces PJ Boulevard, west faces I-95, and the east faces alternate A1A. Now landscaping, I mentioned earlier how we've really intentionally designed the landscape to articulate the building uh, and provide scale to the building. This is a large office building, it's eight stories, about 140 feet tall. And so these uh, medjool date palms that I've circled around the perimeter of the building are all 35 foot clear trunk 
which means they're about 45 feet tall overall, so very large material, providing that scale instantly to the building as soon as it's installed. Additionally, some of those vertical mullion elements that we discussed earlier, uh, here, identified on the graphic, we've integrated landscaping to accentuate those elements uh, even further. So these are mass trees uh, placed around the building in those locations. Again, predominantly native Florida-friendly palette, uh, which aids in the sustainability of the development as well as you know, reducing the irrigation needs and providing that uh, nice pedestrian and walkable environment because all of this landscaping is integrated into those pedestrian spaces that we've uh, spotted all over the, the new areas of development. Moving to the parking garage, you can see a lot of those consistent architectural elements in the design, which reflect in the office building. So really making that unified development. So you can see these two structures are tied together and activating that ground floor use along RCA uh, Center Drive with that ground floor retail. And here on the east and west elevations, you can see the proposed locations for those two project ID signs uh, that we've wanted to integrate into this building. Uh, internal design, we went over the circulation of the garage, highly efficient, very logical. Uh, it's the most efficient garage design that we came up with that we worked directly with Duristress to design. This, they are a precast concrete manufacturer. Uh, we've provided electric vehicle charging stations within the garage. These are uh, going to be level two stations, dual port, uh, so 10 total charging uh, positions. And we've provided uh, covered bicycle and scooter parking uh, within the garage. And this is a location of a compact vehicle space. Again, there's about one per floor, so a total of six. And they're compact because of a support column for the garage. We just couldn't move it. And rather than losing a space, uh, we have about 16 feet for that vehicle, so more than enough for a lot of your average size vehicles to park in that space. And again, about 7,000 square feet of that ground floor retail. And we are proposing a minimum 2,500 square feet of restaurant to ensure that that use category comes uh, immediately. Uh, very important to many of the office users that we speak to to provide that location to where somebody could go down and, and get a coffee or go for lunch if they didn't want to leave. And again, uh, moving towards that idea of those mixture of uses to where they don't have to leave the development if they don't need to, uh, the residential, the office, and providing all everything uh, centric to the development. And then, of course, the uh, SEPTED standards for visibility and sight lines within the garage to make sure it's an inviting place, it's bright, it's open to where people aren't concerned for their safety when they're utilizing the parking structure. Uh, and the structure is not proposed to be um, pay to park. Uh, it's not precluded, uh, but we, we're not proposing for, for payment uh, in, within the garage. And then here's an, a nice rendering of that ground floor view of that front retail on RCA, Bulo, RCA Center Drive and all of that integrated landscaping within that pedestrian space. We are proposing uh, landscape on the rooftop of the garages, both for residential and in pod C. Uh, and we've worked again with Duristress to develop these uh, precast concrete planters, which are a lot more substantial than what we might typically see. And we've done that so we can provide something a little bit more substantial by way of greenery. So uh, we are proposing uh, Clusia uh, trees within those uh, planters, something a bit more substantial, a bit more cover, rather than you know a single stem palm or even a Christmas palm of something of that nature. And those same planters would also be incorporated on the residential garage. So we'll move into pod B. Again, heavy emphasis on connectivity, pedestrian circulation, those uh, pathways all throughout to make sure that those residential users uh, and residents would be able to uh, f fully access uh, each of the uh, various uh, driveways and externally to the development. Now we, again, between 11 and 11A, we are updating this. This ex was an existing egress only, which directed people to the right up to PJ Boulevard. Uh, and we found it was really important to make sure that that was ingress and egress for easy access to the residential garage and as well to take stress on some of the other internal passageways. Uh, we are also proposing to enhance the Design Center Drive intersection with RCA Boulevard 
by adding an additional lane to alleviate some of the traffic there. Again, existing, it's a single lane for left turn through and right traffic. So this will alleviate some of the uh, stacking within that area. Uh, now, again, Building 9 is an existing building and it represented somewhat of a challenge from the start. Uh, couldn't uh, work it to where we were removing this building. There was a substantial investment internally renovating this building prior to this project. And so we're matching those updates externally. But <clears throat> we provided those rideshare spaces adjacent here. Again, easy access to the residential building as well as this office building. But this space between, we work closely with the Richmond Group to develop what we call a pedestrian garden courtyard with lots of amenities. Uh, and working with city staff and the police department, we are proposing secured access from dusk to dawn. Uh, but we didn't want to make it um, too imposing of a gate. So we're proposing a five foot gate and fence, uh, but to make sure we're still maintaining good security at nighttime, we are proposing hostile landscaping on both sides of that fence to secure, secure that at night. We are proposing public art within this space. We're not requesting credit for this public art. It's just a really nice space to be able to place that in and around the landscaping to further en enhance that for both the office as well as the residential tenants. And of course, bike rack, benches, and pedestrian lighting. And here looking at a nice rendering view of what that space uh, would ultimately look like with landscaping. Again, as accurate as we can make it with today's technology, uh, showing the locations of those art pieces, uh, as well as the uh, ultimate feel of what that landscaping would be. Now moving into the update of the exterior of Building 9, uh, Again, that adaptive reuse we talked about with Building 6, the existing building has four main access points. Uh, same points within the, the new layout, but we're also providing four additional access points where we could uh, have those, that activity, the ground floor units directly abutting the streets, activating the space and uh, providing that potential now. So here's a, a nice comparison of the two different architectural styles. The top being existing conditions, the bottom being what we're proposing, much more modern, uh, fitting in with the new uh, residential building as well as the office building, and trying to phase out some of those uh, Mediterranean stylings that have been a part of PGA Station for so long. So here's that existing street view, and then what we're proposing it to look like, much more consistent with the residential building. And another element to, to touch on, this office building is two stories, but in comparison to the residential building behind it, it's, it's roughly four stories of the residential building. Just the different design, internal requirements, and uh, general standards for office spaces. The floor-to-floor the -floor height is a bit taller than residential units. So that brings us to the, the crown jewel, the, the main uh, uh, residential building. Uh, again, 396 units. They are a mixture of uh, studio, one bedroom, two bedroom, and three bedroom units. Uh, we have an attached 606 parking space garage, and if you do the math, it's uh, 0.95 spaces per bed plus 2.5% guests. And so we did a lot of research with our traffic consultant as well as the Richmond Group to develop this parking rate. Um, again, we looked at the total parking at build-up for this development, and we are far exceeding our code without shared parking, um, but we wanted to uh, bring in this parking rate. It's something that it functions, it works very well for uh, residential buildings of this type in this environment, and it's something that the Richmond Group has used in other developments that they've, that they've created to great success. And then, again, wanted to touch on the 10% workforce housing that is being committed to. That would be 120% area median income for a period of 20 years. Now internally looking at the way that we design the residential building, again, with the integration uh, into a developed site to where we're working around existing buildings and existing patterns uh, is something that we spent a lot of time on. And we wanted to create the street activation, that concept of eyes on the street to make sure that we're uh, providing a safe environment as possible. So we do have those ground floor units running directly on the street. We have consolidated our support facilities around the garage and maximizing efficiency as well as safety. The Richmond Group does an amazing job with their uh, amenities, both internal and external. Uh, they have designed their uh, secured, or secured residential amenities 
uh, connected to each other, and we have incorporated uh, public amenity areas outside the building also to the benefit of those residential units. Uh, so the location of those uh, courtyards internal to the building is something very important, and the Richmond Group and their architect do a number of shadow studies to make sure that their locations are the best as possible to make sure maxim ma to maximize sun exposure throughout the year. A little bit more detail, again, highlighting those ground floor units, uh, the consolidation of those amenities, uh, both external to the building as well as internal spaces. And then just uh, the, the long list of the amenities provided by the Richmond Group. We talk about their, their goal to manage the property. They do a great job to make sure that they're uh, providing as much as possible for the residents. Uh, the internal uh, access, the main access to the front door, lots of glass uh, views to the interior pool area, lots of natural light, all the amenity areas consolidated together. And then something else the Richmond Group does is utilizing some of these spaces that may be uh, undervalued. Uh, this uh, hallway connection is an outside hallway connecting the interior courtyard to the exterior, uh, which the Richmond Group brings in nice furniture, amenitizing that area, which can do a space that might otherwise go unused. And then finally, those consolidation of our support facilities, the trash room, our loading area for residential move in and move out, uh, all done by appointment. And then uh, interior bicycle storage. Uh, now in your upper right, you see our trash room facility where their compactors are, and those would be wheeled out uh, and called for pickup. And these facilities would be secured when not in use. Uh, the interior uh, parking structure, again, providing electric vehicle charging station. We are fully wiring it for 17 stations, level two chargers, uh, both handicap and standard parking spaces. We do have interior bicycle storage secured with uh, the vertical bike racks, again, maximizing bicycle storage. There is a dog wash room within the garage, another um, um, amenity for residents. And then we are proposing a compact spaces as another parking option within the residential garage. Um, so eight and a half foot wide, but also providing parking at nine and a half foot wide. So a, a variety of parking options. And here looking at uh, some of the elevations of that residential building, uh, some uh, very nice contemporary architecture with some traditional flair as well, with varying colors and materials used to break up the, the building. It is a large building. Uh, here's some nice uh, renderings of the exterior. This is the northwest uh, corner, again, that main entrance. Here's the west side of the building. And then I, I really like this rendering view uh, because this is the eastern side of the building, but it almost looks like two different buildings with the architectural details and articulation that the architect has integrated. And then we talked about the activation of the street, the eyes on the street principle, and, and designing those units that are on the ground floor and making sure that there's an appropriate separation of that private, semi-private, public realm. And then briefly wanted to touch on the locations of those two residential ID signs that we are proposing on the north corner uh, as well as on the eastern side. Uh, and they are uh, have been designed, and we do have a signage package included uh, that we have submitted. And that brings us to the end. Uh, try to be as concise and thorough as possible, but if you have any questions, <laughs> please let us know. Thank you. Thank you, that's a big project. Um, does staff have anything to add to that? Unfortunately, I do. <laughs> 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 but uh, I'll forego the 68 slide presentation that I have. Uh, instead, I'd <laughs> <laughs> I do, unless you really want to see it, but uh, I do have it a, um, uh, we do have an abbreviated presentation, but before we get to that, for the record, uh, uh, Martin Fitz, <laughs> principal planner, and I have been sworn in, uh, I apologize. <laughs> I would like to uh, take a moment to recognize the fact that um, we have, staff has been working with the applicant on, on this particular project for well over two years, 
and the project has uh, gone through quite a few changes during that time. And the applicant has worked very diligently with staff to address the uh, comments and the recommendations that we've made uh, so that we can get to the point where we have this uh, plan that we was presented to you tonight. And staff is very happy with, with where we are. The project has, um, does a, goes a long way to activate the TOD and enhance the TOD district that was, uh, as you know, recently incorporated into the comprehensive plan. The applicant has, um, has worked very hard with staff to uh, provide the residential element and the voluntary dedication of the workforce housing to really incorporate those TOD uh, concepts and the, to make a, a workable mixed-use uh, project within the, the center of the city. And also, I'd like to take a moment to, uh, to thank my coworkers, Joanne Scaria, and Don Sonneborn, the three of us have been working very closely on this project for the past year and year and a half, uh, and there's no way I could have done half the stuff on this without their help. So, uh, as I mentioned, we, uh, our, uh, the applicant did a very thorough presentation of, of many of the key highlights uh, of the project, and I do, I do want to hit a few key points, however. As you can see, I'm skipping quite a few of these here. Mm -hmm. the, the applicant is requesting six waivers uh, for this project. Three of those are dealing with signage and then three with other development um, criteria. Staff is recommending uh, approval of five of those uh, waivers, and we are recommending uh, denial for waiver three for the signs on the accessory structure of the parking garage. Now, the applicant is requesting the waiver because the code, uh, our sign code, does not permit uh, signage on an accessory structure. And we, when we were reviewing the staff has been, uh, in general, has been very consistent in our application of the sign code referencing, with reference to parking garages. This, uh, during our, as a result of this, there are no parking garages within the city with a developer uh, sign on, uh, on the uh, facade. And in fact, in our research, when we were looking at other municipalities, uh, we found that uh, this type of signage on parking garages is by far the exception, not the rule. Uh, and if this uh, sign is approved, it would be the first developer uh, sign on a parking garage. And in fact, the, uh, the parking garage in um, PGA station in building 12, which faces the uh, RCA or PGA, uh, requested a sign in 2008 and council denied that sign at that time. I will also point out that staff is not opposing the signage for the ground floor tenants, uh, which would be on those active ground floor sign, active ground floor tenants on the east and north, or any of the uh, directional or instructional signage such as entrance, exit, and um, the other signage associated with the garage. And as we pointed out, this is uh, consistent with the TOD concepts in the comprehensive plan and is also co consistent with the LDR regulations. This project has been duly noticed, uh, and both for PZAP and for uh, council. This did go to the, to the Planning, Zoning, and Appeals Board at the October hearing, where it w did receive a recommendation of approval uh, and a recommendation of approval for waivers one, two, four, five, and six, and a recommendation of denial for waiver three by a vote of six to one. The uh, Planning, Zoning, and Appeals Board did recommend adding a condition of approval that the first floor of the parking garage should not be gated or have access control at any time, and that condition has been included in the resolution. And staff does uh, continue to recommend approval of Resolution 62, 2021, as presented, with a recommendation of approval for waivers one, two, four, five, and six, and a recommendation of denial for waiver three. And staff is available if you have any questions. Well, thank you both. There is no doubt that this is a major 
addition to Palm Beach Gardens and signals the redevelopment and new development within our TUD. And I want to take this time to thank Mr. Carafumo for the 40 workforce housing units and uh, the 20-year the deed restriction on those. It, that is important to the TOD. It's important to the city. It definitely makes a statement that hopefully others will be anxious to follow. So thank you for that. Um, who has questions? Carl, you want to start with questions? I do have a question, um, kind of unrelated, but the parking garage that's already in existence with 428 spaces by building number 12. How many people actually park there now, number one? Is it utilized much or not much? Dan Catalfimo, 60%. Okay. And there will be a pedestrian walkway because assuming the rail station is built and these other two buildings are, well, office building number six is built, the parking garage adjacent in pod C6A is going to primarily provide parking for the office building, at least in today's world of car traffic. Um, but if it does fill up because the train station is there, there's a pedestrian pathway from the existing parking garage, so that, that would be overflow parking. Because I know that you said that there's a potential to build additional parking on that parking structure in the future should there be a need, but Perhaps it may not be needed if the other, okay. Thank you. I'm going to ask a question just cut right now because it just backs up on, on Mark's question about the parking garages. 6A is the garage where we're not having, where we're having open access on the first floor and then the other floors will not. Correct, okay. Um, what about residents, uh, residents? businesses in the other buildings, the office buildings that exist now. I actually spoke with someone who owns one of those buildings and the complaint was there's not enough parking. They didn't know that there were gonna be parking garages. They heard this project was coming in and they were concerned. They said there already isn't enough parking. How are you gonna make sure that there's enough? And was very happy to hear there would be two. Will they have access to this garage if they are in the project somewhere there, there is there is full shared parking throughout the development so the adjacent buildings would have the ability to park in the garages so all the all the parking spaces within the development would be available that's good to know okay except the residential right the residential is going to be yeah, for so they have yeah. a secured access to their garage um, that they would have okay thank you all right i'll come back to mine later all right. and then just briefly i wanted to i, I failed to mention during the presentation. I did mention that we could expand the garage, but here uh, is a really good angle of that rooftop. And you can see uh, the step design, how the western side is lower than the eastern. And we would be able to extend that top floor around the front there to provide additional parking in the event that the station were to be built and those parking spaces were needed. So we've designed it to, to be able to incorporate that additional parking. That was another question. Great, thank you. Mark, you can finish. Yeah, I'm, I'm done with questions regarding the project. Mars, you, Marcy, you want to go? Did Carl go? Mm-hmm. Oh, wow, he was going okay. No, oh, you didn't go yet? Oh, oh, let, Carl said you can go anytime, so you can go after Marcy then. Okay, you'll go after Marcy. Uh, <laughs> oh, my goodness. Jeez, Louise, I'm getting a reputation. I know, right? Um, well, first of all, I'll start by saying that uh, this is obviously a very extensive project from a TOD perspective, from future transit opportunities, um, and also importantly, uh, workforce housing. I do wanna uh, thank you for volunteering to provide workforce housing. That is something that is, we've all talked about, and this is you know, obviously a perfect spot so, for it, so we really appreciate that. Um, and I commend you all staff and the applicant for uh, really thinking through this uh, project and paying close attention to uh, the detail and uh, working together to create a really thoughtful design. So I really, really appreciate that. Um, with that said, actually, uh, 
our mayor uh, spoke to the same person that I spoke to, <laughs> so I was going to ask the same question. Um, how, uh, which you already addressed in regards to the parking, but how are you going to, I guess, logistically wise, um, take care of the existing tenants during the construction process? Because obviously that's, you have, you know, it's, it's a very large project. You have existing uh, clients and tenants. And um, can you please kind of walk me through how you're going to do that? Hi, again, Dan Catalfino. Um, George, if you can pull up that staging plan. We purposely uh, left Pod C vacant while the Richmond group that we partnered with is building their building. We're also keeping our building number nine vacant except for our offices. So we basically, when we repurchased the property almost three years ago, the building has been vacant. It'll be vacant again for two more years, so that's 20,000 square feet. That doesn't need parking because we can't have construction and pedestrians walking around. Um, but the staging area on, on Pod C is where they're going to be able to put all their heavy material, all their workforce, all the workers can work there. And then once the staging area is done, they're pretty much inside their building, and then we have our vacant lot, and then we'll start our construction. Thank you. And then so for access, because during construction, obviously, access will be... Um you know, modified from time to time, you know, temporarily. Is that going to be communicated with the existing tenants um, prior to any change of access for them? We are actually doing that now. We actually sent out notices between right now, built between building 11 and 11A. We have now made that two lanes. We purposely did most of this construction before the Richmond group would start theirs by doing the lake first, by doing the infrastructure, and by doing all the, the road work, it will be completed in two weeks. So anytime that any time a road, road would be closed for any type of construction, notices would go out. Thank you. And then obviously traffic is a big issue to everybody. Um, they see construction and they, say, they just assume big buildings, going to be a lot of traffic. We obviously <laughs> understand that this is a TOD area and we appreciate the, the cross, everything. But I guess... Um, you're utilizing existing uh, unbuilt square footage um, here. So from a traffic, obviously utilizing the traffic equivalency um, process and standpoint, what would be the net gain or loss from a traffic standpoint as far as trips? One, well, one of the things that was easy to do, just a, a simple trip, tra uh, Stephanie could do that, but the 80,000 square foot building that we tore down is really just going over to Pod C that had 64,000 square feet. So we, we, that kind of washed itself out. So it's really just the residential capture. And the beauty part now by adding food services, which we didn't have before, for an example, when we have uh, clients over for lunch, we have to order or go out to lunch. It's going to be great to be able to walk next door or have food brought to any of the places, especially now that we brought TBC's third building uh, we re relocated them from Juneau with uh, Joey Eichner's help. We moved 60,000 square feet from Juneau. Not to say that we took them from Juneau, but they are now we, we, all... We won't all tell all anybody. Fine. That's okay. <laughs> we like them here better. <laughs> but they're all here now, and their, their fit first thing is, when are we getting the food service? So mm -hmm. part of the complex. Yeah, important. We like to think okay. we're going home, too. Yeah. Okay. Good evening. Uh, for the record, Stephanie Kinlan with Kimley Horn. Uh, I'm the traffic engineer for the project, and I have been sworn in. Um, the the project in terms of net gain in traffic, uh, in regards to the existing approvals for the site, we're looking at an increase of 190 a.m. peak hour trips and 202 p.m. peak hour trips. However, we did conduct a full traffic study looking at the surrounding intersections, and that was what allowed us to come to the agreement with the city to make those improvements, such as... Um, improving the access at the driveway that directly accesses RCA Boulevard, uh, widening the, the egress lanes um, to allow for separate left and right turn lanes at Design Center Drive, and then a number of proportionate share payments for uh, improvements such as, future improvements such as a future roundabout at North Court Parkway and RCA Boulevard and a future southbound right turn lane at RCA Boulevard and alternate A1A. To, and to facilitate that. And does that take into account the uh, FPL site because it's existing development? Yes, that was considered a, a committed trip that we considered in our future analysis. Okay. 
And um, in the presentation, you mentioned the generator room, um, and it, I don't know if you alluded to the fact that it was, it, it sounded like it was, I originally thought it was gonna be built, but then you had said uh, room for a generator building. Is the generator gonna be there or not? No, the generator building north of building six? Correct. It will be built, that will be generated. At the same time, and that yeah. is, is that generator building used for the life safety um, elements of both the residential and the office building? No, it's strictly for the office building and the garage, so it fully supports the building six and six A, the parking structure. The uh, residential building has its own internal uh, generator system. It's internal to the building? It's within the parking structure. Oh. One thing I want to add is for our generator building for building six, it is by diesel, which it starts with diesel and runs with natural gas. Um, it's, it will power the entire building and also power the entire uh, garage. So it's not just life safety, it also does the entire facility. Oh, very good, that's awesome. <laughs> Um, and well, I think you mentioned, and I wanted to clarify, the parking structure adjacent to the rail is not going to be access controlled um, now or in the future. Correct. So, yeah, so the, the condition is for the ground floor to mm -hmm. not be access control ever, ever. And then we are not proposing to have access control in the garage now or in the future with a tri-rail station. It's, it's not precluded, but it's not part of the design currently. Okay. Um, and uh, you had mentioned the planters, which is very exciting. I like them very much and a uh, very thoughtful plant palette. I appreciate that. Are the drainage downspouts for the irrigation um, on the garage buildings, are they exterior or interior? And are they hidden? In interior. Interior, perfect. And then the 17 charging stations for 600 cars, is that what you said? Right, so it's, it's fully wired for the 17 stations in, in the residential garage. In the residential garage, correct. And wired, or are this charging stations going to be built? So day one, I think ten stations will be installed. Seven, seven will be installed, but I think it's uh, ten positions, uh, and, the, and those would be uh, on day one. And the additional could be installed by demand, as demand as it would be required. And, and is there room for additional? Should there be the need? Because it seems like everyone is using all these charging stations. I know even in my office building, they're all used up every day and everyone keeps fighting for them. There is a potential with the um, higher level charging stations. They do require uh, you know, additional you know, electric capacity that has to be pre-engineered. Pre but um, with you know, the current facilities and operating procedures for the Richmond Group, they found that you know, this was uh, gonna be an appropriate number um, with the lower level charging stations, I believe they could add some more in the future. Mm -hmm. um, but currently, um, they, with their research, they found that that would be enough for this facility. Okay. Yep, I want to continue Marcy's discussion there because I got a big one on, on both parking garages. Right now, they're level two. A lot of places are finding level two is not going to cut it very soon. Uh, we, level three for most of the new electric cars coming out is going to be standard. Since we're starting on the ground floor, can't they be wired? Can't we upgrade to level three? We just asked that of our last applicant, and they were able to, to agree to move to level three. I can answer that for the office building. Level three requires 480 volts. Level two requires 240. Uh, we do not have 480, and most people who say that they can do the level three need to ask their power company if they have 480 volts, which they don't. Um, so it's a difference between them. Um, we're, we're going through this in one of our condominium project where we oversized the conduit to do the 240 volts, which gives them a four-hour charge. Yeah, yeah. I can. I'll comment on, on, on yeah. that as well. The, the level two chargers actually are, are very, very efficient, So, which is what you have, I believe, out in the parking lot. Mm -hmm. So I, I drive a Tesla. I have a level two charger at the office. I have no charger at home, and uh, I haven't pulled it out for, oh, I, it's, I've got it. It's in the trunk. It came with a car, and I don't even use it. So I'm able to charge my car at the office. So any of the office users that's there for any period of extended day, 
they go home with their cars fully charged, uh, you know, certainly at, uh, at your expense, Marcy, I'm sure that they go, mm -hmm. go home. So the, the techno battery charging technology, if you've been reading, it's changing. The new technology is anticipated to charge the batteries quicker. So mm -hmm. I think what you'll see with, with GM's new plant, with Ford's new plant, uh, Toyota announced building a new battery plant, that the technology for charging is going to be a lot faster than what it is. But at downtown at the gardens, we, in cooperation with uh, Electrify America, we did put in some level mm -hmm. three chargers. The transformers over there that your staff can attest to, I mean, it, it was, they're, they're, they're significant and we just happened to be in a location where we could get the, could get the power for the 480, uh, for, the, for the level three chargers. Uh, but you know, you know, in the event that there's a need, and as that need grows, I mean, th these are fairly sophisticated structures. You know, in installing a level two charger is not the end of the end of the world. Most of the garages that we have downtown West Palm Beach, the city hall, which Dan built many years ago, you know, all of those have been retrofitted with more electric chargers. So as need occurs, you know, it certainly could be added. I, I believe that there's seven uh, stations in in that uh, in in the residential garage and ten charging stations in the six A garage. Is that correct, Martin? I think it's active at at beginning. At, at the time of construction, that that's correct. And then in the residential garage, it's being pre-wired to be able to add ten additional. So they, it has the has the potential to have 27 total uh, okay. EV charging spaces for the project. Right. It, is seven going to be enough? Oh, in the residential, you will have 10 more to make it 17, is what you're saying. But the uh, 6A garage is going to have the 10. So if you have 10, 10, 10, oh, there 10, 10 doubles, so it's 20. 20. No, it's it's five doubles. It's so five doubles. Ten, That's ten what ports. I thought. Yeah. Ten ports. So if you have a, a nine hundred and ninety eight parking spots and you have ten ports for that whole building, and we're still in a situation where like you go in and you plug it in, you're there all day. There are going to be a lot of tenants that don't have a place to plug in their car. We're actually running. We're actually running conduit. We're actually running conduit to almost all the spaces as we're building it. Um, we know okay. over the future, I mean, this building has a commitment for 20 to 30 years. Um, I didn't, never thought I would be tearing down my own building <laughs> 12 years ago, but we're thinking much further ahead. So there will be conduits almost on every floor where if we do need them, we can pull up. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense then. Okay. That is, is thoughtful planning. Okay. Um, Chelsea, you had a question. Well, first of all, thank you, Mayor and Marcy for taking that one. <laughs> that was, that's usually Chelsea that goes after that. <laughs> nice to just sit back and watch on that one today. Uh, I just have one question. I'll have some comments later. But, well, first, before I make my question, I do want to thank our staff, previous councils, Mr. Catafomo, our city manager, and the applicant, and everyone else today for seeing the future and making it happen tonight. So I'm really honored to be sitting here while this takes place. So thank you guys. I uh, just have one question, which I did bring up during my agenda review, is about the first floor of the residencies. Can you explain some of the safety to me there? Um, and so, because it's close to a road, so how do we make sure that our residents are safe on that first floor? Absolutely, so I'll bring up that view again of those ground floor units here. So we have, we have developed these porch areas at the entrance of these ground floor units to be um, with, with a small gate, a hip gate, if, if you will, at the entrance to those that is slightly elevated above the area, uh, as well as providing a landscape in front of those units. So the idea being that the landscaping provides some of that separation from the public sidewalk to separate the space and the uh, screened gate. So we, we see the mesh portion as well as the solid portion provide some of that additional security working with the police department we found that you know if that was all um, op you know if it was, was not opaque and you were to leave a bike out there or some toys or something you know it's very easy to see someone could come up and, and take it right off the porch uh, also providing the gate entrance to that little patio area is an additional security feature providing that separation so 
from a security standpoint, we're trying to screen potential items that might be left on the porch, as well as providing a physical barrier. If someone wants to go over it, they, they could, but again, ground floor facing units with lots of windows, eyes on the street, that sort of uh, SEPTED standard to make sure that we're providing that security feature for those units. And they're also providing hostile vegetation. Hostile. Look at you. <laughs> <laughs> at least it's not ferns, as long it's as there's no ferns. <laughs> there, there will Except also be tail. security cameras for the building. Right, I know, I'm just thinking about also just you know, how close the cars are too, so that's, it's, you know, it's concerning, but thank you for answering my question. And I just had two, two more. Um, the facade of the building, um, it is beautiful. There's a lot of glass, and staff was not able to answer the question when I asked it at the agenda review, so hopefully you will have the answer. On hurricane protection, I have in my mind all those visions from Houston when the hurricane hit, and the first thing that went was all the glass in the office buildings downtown, and we are developing our TOD with this as the the first structure and probably a lot of others that are gonna emulate it. So what protection is there there? So with the, with the office building, I know the impact class, again, high efficiency class that's being utilized. I believe the entire building was developed to be category five. That's correct. Wow. Thank you. So okay. that was something that was important from the start of the design. Even through all the iterations, we wanted to keep that standard. Absolutely. Okay, great. That's, that's good to know. Um, the other question has, is another traffic question. It's, it's not something that the applicant's responsible for. It's something that exists and we can't do much about it. But I was wondering, when you're going east on PGA Boulevard and you come under that bridge, and you are getting that merge lanes, two of them off of I-95, and you have to make the right turn onto RCA Boulevard. It comes up on you and nobody knows what to do. Is there a way to encourage entrance off of A1A signage, the entrance to the development, to the station, some kind of, to, to have them so people will go that way in, and, and and come around rather than come in there. Um, I'm not sure about this, this providing signage in that location, but I believe there was a part of a proportionate uh, payment for an enhancement to the turn lane from alternate A1A to RCA. Uh, so that would be something that could be done in the future to make sure that the traffic in that area is accounted for. Yeah. Yeah. I just thought if it looked more like this is the entrance to PGA station, not coming in by the Sunoco station right under the bridge where you got to make that right. That um, well, the, Don Hearing, for, uh, for the record, when everything is built, I think that you're going to see a, a significant presence of this project on A1A and, and, and as you're driving by. So A1A will be, will be used more, uh, but also as the synergies of uses not only here on this site, I mean, I mean, to the you know, the opportunities for people to live here and work at RCA Center, uh, just to the south, uh, the the mm -hmm. North Corp uh, Park. I mean, there's a million square feet of high tech and significant uh, industry life sciences there. You got you know FPNL to the north. I, you know, I think we're going to see you know a lot of different modalities of of, uh, of movement. Uh, of people walking uh, and, uh, and, and, and hopefully as time progresses with other types of trolley services and other services uh, that might come about to move people around. So yeah, the, the nice part about this site is if I'm working there, you know, you know where Kyoto Gardens is. You know, you know how to get in and out of the site. Um, and, and, and we think that that will happen pretty, pretty, pretty soon. There was a, a right turn lane that was constructed a few years ago uh, as a part of uh, uh, the, uh, this project for uh, PGA Station uh, at, the, uh, at uh, PGA Boulevard and the, the gas station mm -hmm. right there. Uh, so that helps. Uh, certainly additional, you know, just roadway signage, not project signage, um, you know, could easily be installed by DOT to help make that a little bit more uh, more, more visible in the future. We have another big project that ultimately will will come into that spot to further complicate that right turn. Yeah. So. Well, hopefully, as as time goes on, the, the 
increases in density here, you know, are going to create even more synergies. So mm -hmm. it, it, it's the, the synergies, uh, you know, are, are intended to come together. And of course, you know, we have to have that critical mass ultimately there in order to get tri rail there and having, you know, light rail and, and hopefully even something better than that, you know, in the future. So, uh, you know, you know it, it, it'll work. Okay. So on that, I will ask for a motion and a second. You, oh, I, you I have another question? I'm okay. sorry. Go no, go, go right I, ahead. I hate to ask questions, no, but this is our only chance. So, it's a big project. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm going to ask you a question for you. The art in some public places, uh, all the art that you have in the project now, is that... Um, is that um, already been approved by the IPP? So it's going to come to the IPP board, all the art pieces through the... Yeah, the locations okay. we identified today are going to the AIPP board soon. It's, it's been under review, and we've, we've gone through a couple rounds of, of review on that, but it has not been approved to this point. Okay. Um, so this pretty much finishes 5B. This, this project pretty much finishes what's going on there. Uh, 2,500 square... You mentioned food. Uh, restaurant or you know 2,500 square feet of, of restaurant for all of this office space is that going to be enough it, or is there room for more it's restaurant a, it's, space it's a minimum to yeah, make it, sure that it's it, not less than 2,500 square feet what we wanted to do was to make a commitment out of the box to have some sort of food service there you know for the office workers and for the employees that are yeah, I, I, and, the, and those that live in the in the residential, so that at a minimum that would be built. I think you, you know, need more I, than twenty. I think you need well, more you, options. You, you, you'll one probably one. have a, a multitude of smaller restaurants. So your yeah. your typical restaurant, like a J. Alexander's, which is you know about six thousand square feet, that's not the type of restaurant that would happen here. But what you could get is a pizza shop, a coffee shop, and another. And so what we wanted to do was to ensure out of the gate, at a minimum, 2,500 square feet. But where else would they go other than that 7,500 square feet? That, that 7,500, well, to be honest with you, as George had pointed out, you know, one of the things that uh, we did not only with the residential but with the, uh, with the office building is making sure that we had spaces that could evolve. So there's no reason if a restaurant came here and the market was there and it was right or another user and they wanted to be on the ground floor of the office building, uh, they could be there uh, on the ground floor with a direct access right to, you know, right out to the street without having to go into the building itself. The idea that we could engage the street. So we would anticipate as this district evolves that you'll have more of those professional services that aid to the pedestrian, somebody that might be getting on a train or walking, that will be able to take advantage of those, of those spaces. So... Uh, it's fully flexible and able to do that. And even when we did the, uh, the entire kingdom building, uh, we worked with staff so that those, those spaces, those units, or the ground floor of those office spaces, that front design center drive, that main drive, uh, have the ability to uh, have doors put in them uh, and become another use other than office, or maybe a, a retail use or professional services type use that would aid uh, mobility and, and be, create the attention for pedestrians. Yeah, minimizing the number of times people have to leave the areas is the key. Thank you. Carl, you have been very patient. You've been very quiet. I forgot you were there. You know, I'm normally quiet. All right, well, <laughs> we've been beating this up for almost an hour, so I'm just going to forego my time. I really had only had one. Uh, yeah. It was, wasn't even a question, but it was. Um, I'm just going to bring it up during discussion. And then just so we can speed this along. Okay, so let's get a... I just have one have, more question. Marcy has take, one more I'll question. I'll take Carl's time for one more question. <laughs> <laughs> and that is um, maybe to staff, since you were talking about restaurants, for the office building, is do they have to come back through the process to add an ancillary cafe inside the office building? No. Thank you. Not to you. <laughs> okay. okay. All right, so let's get a motion and a second to approve. Let me make the motion. You got okay. it. Do it right. I'm absolutely going to proudly uh, make a motion to approve resolution 62-2021. Minus with, 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 minus, with minus, minus one side. number three. Right. Right. Minus, minus three. waiver number three. I minus, will second that. You'll second what? You have to say. Oh, the motion that Carl just made, uh, which excludes waiver three from the approval. 
Okay, now I will bring it back for discussion, and Carl, you are first. Wow. Briefly, this is, this is the future of, of PJ Station and how it ties into Florida Power and Light, how it ties into downtown at the gardens, and um, it fits our mobility plan, our TOD vision perfectly. I appreciate the two years of being beat up plus trying to get where you're at. But I think if you were to take a step back in time and you realize where you're at now with this relationship with the city, you're probably happy maybe you, you, you took this journey to get where you're at. Um, I, would, I wanted to bring in the component of Todd and his relationship with the Catafumo team um, because it, you guys weren't here earlier, but. It, this council and the staff, we have relationships with um, with our developers. And and Dan, I know you got a lot of stuff all over the place, but um, you know, with the Avenir people and the downtown people, the Florida Light people, and it, it goes on and on and on. But you're Todd. You're entering into a relationship with this city, and give him the mic anyway. I want you to briefly. Explain your relationship and then what your component is with this project and how you're invested into our community for the, uh, the long haul. Todd, for the record, Todd Fabry, the Richmond Group. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight and speak um, and for this opportunity as well. Um, we got into this venture um, and knowing full well that we were doing it um, together with Mr. Catafumo and the rest of the project and we're um, happy to have done that and we've been uh, very pleased with the process with the city. City staff has been amazing. They've really worked um, in a very professional manner to get what I think is a phenomenal project for the city. And we're very excited about being part of that. And obviously, from a, a residential standpoint, to be able to have uh, you know, a project of this size in a location in, in a Class A city like Palm Beach Gardens, and to be in an area where folks can live here and potentially walk to work, um, walk to services, walk to uh, restaurants and retail is um, from, from a residential owner standpoint is phenomenal. Um, it ad obviously adds that much more value to our project and uh, to uh, uh, you know, the, the long term. And as you know, in terms of long term, uh, the Richmond Group is a little bit different than some of the other developers because um, I think someone mentioned earlier on, um, and, and Mr. Catafumo uh, understands this, is that we're long-term holders. Um, we don't um, typically build uh, development, lease it up, and sell it. Um, we're a vertically integrated residential development uh, firm. We professionally manage all of our projects once they're completed, and uh, we'll be involved every step of the process, and we'll be involved for many, many years to come. So I think from the city's standpoint, we are the, uh, you know, ideal uh, developer uh, for this project because of that reason, because of, of our long-term commitment to the city. And like I said, it's a great city and we understand that. We have a local presence here in Palm Beach County. We've got an office here in Palm Beach County. We've been here for over 25 years doing development. And so you know, we can't really stress but enough how extremely excited we are about this opportunity. So you're going to manage this building for 20 years? Yes. We, we, thir we, do, we don't have a third-party management. We professionally manage all of our own buildings. It's an affiliated-owned company by the Richmond, Richmond Group of Companies. Uh, our management team will, will manage this project um, for many, many years to come. So, yes. Okay. Thank you. Which brings quality to the people that live there when we have a, a management team that owns the building? You know, um, so I appreciate that. I'm going to so wholly support this because it, it really is the vision of the future. And we don't have a choice to get it wrong in, in, in this particular area or anywhere in the city. We don't get it wrong. 
which is one of the reasons why Dan, how many, we talk over and over and over, Joey, Todd, and on this project, you know, it's really the beginning of mobility and our TOD vision, you know, that this council set up and, the, and of course, the staff. So we're, you, you know, you guys nailed it. And, you know, I'm so proud for you guys to be a part of, you know, the Palm Beach Gardens family. And, you know, we appreciate really, you know, the double, the, the doubling the art in, in uh, public places, which is kind of one of my pet peeves that Eric Jablin somehow shoved into me somehow. But, um, you know, so I appreciate all of it. It's a beautiful building. It's a great location. It's really high in, uh, high, uh, it's intensity, high density, and it, and it really fits here. And, um, you know, I just wanted to make sure I got it right on my vote because sometimes I've, you know, I'm not an engineer and sometimes I vote for these things and then when I see them, I'm like, that's huge, you know? So I know I got this right for the long term of our community, so. Before you make your, your vote, I truly want to thank staff and especially Peter. Um, he pushed us to a different level, which at a 40 plus years, actually sparked and made us go somewhere we never thought. And staff has been incredible. Um, very hard, but very incredible. They yeah. brought things to our light that we did not see because we were so close to the project. Um, again, I started this journey 30 plus years ago with Palm Beach Gardens. We bought the property from MacArthur in 1999. Made us feel old back then when it was just green. Um, and like I said, this is a birth of the new park. And I think that you're gonna see this over and over again, and staff has designed our little handbook perfectly for the next generations. Yeah, so I haven't thank said you. it, but thank you, Peter, and, and all of our, our team for making sure this got done right, because we knew this was the core of our vision. You know, we know Avenir, you know, and Panther, this is really our central of everything that we've got going on. You know, we need to get the train up here. We need to get Tri-Rail up here. And, and, and this is the first building that's got, everything's going to surround it. So I've said enough, and I let's thank you guys uh, once again for doing everything that you've done to get this right. Well said. Mark? Um, I think it's just important that the residents remember that this is um, part of the future of the city. It will include some challenges, uh, obviously with traffic and growth, but that's what that's what happens when you're a forward-thinking city, and you know this. You know, Palm Beach Gardens is the is the financial center of the of North Palm Beach County, and and this is part of that vision. So, you know, this is the city that was planned out many years ago, and we're, you know we're part of the of the of, of realizing the plan, and partners like you guys is helping make this. And it's going to come with some headaches, but it's going to come with a whole lot more opportunity, which is really what it's all about. So, thank you, Marcy. I, I'm not going to talk very long, Carl, <laughs> but I do want to thank you again. And also, since we have such a great relationship now, I just encourage you to bring the rest of your property right into our city of Palm Beach Gardens. If you consider buying Lomans. And uh, yeah, that's a good point. This is right off 95. Oh, okay. Let's see. So if there was a pattern book for TOD, I think this would be it. Like literally, if there was a a checklist of how to do TOD, you guys, we have, you have done that. So thank you for that. And this is, like I said before, why I wanted to be here. I wanted to pass and promote policy for our residents that would give them the opportunity to get around without a car, to help our urban core become connected, to um, put in sustainability, and again, honored to even be here. And I want to take a moment just to think about what's happening in the world and where Palm Beach Gardens is in that in our forward thinking ways because businesses all over America are going to mixed use urban centers now because that's where life is and that's what we're developing here. And I remember Don told me about this like four years ago and then now we're here. So it's, it's really exciting to see that we are making this project. It's supporting social connections, business, economic development, transportation, utilizing transportation and land use so that we have a more choices. So again, um, I think we're all saying that. I just want to say thank you to all of you for making this happen. Good work. Thank you, Chelsea. Well, change is uncomfortable, but it's exciting. And this is definitely exciting. 
And again, thank you for the thoughtful planning of how this will go down to minimize the discomfort that the other tenants have and that the residents will have as this build out happens. So excited to have you as a partner again in the city and uh, thank you to everybody who worked on it, Peter and, and the rest of the staff uh, for, for getting us to this point. So with that, um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes 5-0. We're going to keep talking, though. You guys can leave. <laughs> OK, so we are, have no resolutions, but we are at items for council action discussion, an item of interest. And I have none. No. I did mine up front. No, 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 no. I believe Chelsea has one. I have like three, so bu buckle up. Oh, buckle up. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have anything before I go? OK, Marcy, you're going to go. Marcy has one, and Chelsea has three. All right, mine's very brief, and I just wanted to say that um, November is the time to be thankful and uh, a time to remember and a time to embrace those that enrich our lives. Uh, this crazy pandemic has uh, really uh, put many things in perspective for me, and I'm very thankful and grateful for my health and my family, and I'm also so very thankful to be back on the council and working with all of you. That's it. Happy Thanksgiving. Well, that was nice. All right, so I have a couple of quick things. Number one, uh, we did at the TPA last month, we did the Bright Line Pledge. So I will share this with everybody. So since we're talking about encouraging a train station here, I will uh, share that with council. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, at our next council meeting, I'd like to bring back up our pursuit of an ordinance for balloons and confetti and consider moving our styrene resolution to an ordinance. So I thought I'd get that conversation going. And lastly, very good news, the TPA voted in something called the SRM program, which is a state road modification program. So we have the opportunity to have access to about $20 million. So imagine if on alternate A1A, where the train tracks are, where all that shrubbery and weeds and everything is, if, there, if we had money that could clean that up. So that's what this is. Any state road that we don't have any control over, even though it's, even though it's in Palm Beach Gardens, if it's a state road, we, we don't do anything with it. It's theirs. So the state road modification, and I'll send out the information on it. So the way it works is there's over $20 million available to advance safety, complete streets, or roadway modification uh, used for traffic calming, intersection modifications, all of that stuff. So they're going to let staff know well ahead. I think uh, the applications will be due in February, so we can start even if it's not one of our roads, because we already work with the Transportation Alternatives Program. That's where we're getting the lights in on Holly and things like that. So this is one more funding program that we need to be smart about and ask for that money for the roads that are part of Palm Beach Gardens that are under our control. Can we get the railroad ties up with that money? Um, yeah, that might Are we work. ever going to get those railroad ties up? Well, let, maybe may, we'll find out. So let's but find out so if that can So you all will know, we, we got state funding from FDOT for landscaping A1A, not only the medians, but on the railroad side, but in the road median as well. Getting a, a, a grant and permission to plant on FEC right of way, totally different story. A lot of experience with not being able to do that. Agreed. Okay. Understood. We'll look into it. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Don't hold your breath. Yeah. <laughs> now, Max. Been a long couple of weeks. A month. Month. Well, month yeah. is a couple of weeks. About a month, month and a half. Yeah. Um, Tomorrow's our final, uh, is the last day of our hearing on the county's uh, motion for a temporary injunction. So we've got a couple of witnesses and a little more evidence to put in tomorrow. They have their rebuttal witness. Um, we'll cross them. And then um, after that, it'll be um, oddly, we're going to have closing arguments, which is not something that's normally that common in a temporary injunctive relief hearing. Normally, you end up just writing a, a post hearing uh, brief. But be that as it may, we're doing both. And we're um, proffering a uh, proposed order to the judge as well. Um, 
I'm very, very proud of uh, the of the legal team, um, Mr. Hawkins and Walt Poor, our assistant city attorney, as well as Lainey Williams, who is a 3L at University of Florida and interning at Jones Foster. She has been, uh, she's a brilliant young lady. Um, and also, I cannot say enough about uh, the support that we've gotten from the city staff. Um, all of the efforts, this has been truly a team effort. Um, responding to the requests for production that were had no basis in reality and the county didn't even need, but they just did it to be uh, um, basically for retribution. Um, the discovery, all the interrogatories that we answered that were really somewhat pointless, but again, they just propounded them because they could, because it was uh, retribution, as well as all the depositions that they did of city staff, which was almost entirely retribution. Um, so I appreciate the, the, the support from everyone and their patience, as well as the patience from the staff, as they have some of their legal needs, most of their legal needs have uh, been sitting on the shelf waiting um, as we have been inundated with this. Um, this will not be the end of this fight. This is just the very, very beginning. Um, I do not believe we will win this case at this hearing. Um, our objective is to make sure that the county doesn't get their temporary injunction granted. That's our goal. Um, but what I can promise you is um, I'll keep fighting until you tell me to quit or there are no avenues left in the courts. Thank you. Well, guys, we did good tonight. We did some big, important, <laughs> big, important stuff. It was very, a long one, agenda. but a very fulfilling meeting. So, um, with that, hey, hey Max. By the way, Max, you have a question um, for Max? I don't have a. Qu I just want to make a statement. You know, I know how hard you've been working on this for the past long time, uh, and I do appreciate it. I know everyone here appreciates what you're doing because, as a council and as a city, we believe in it. And uh, I think you're one of the best people we could have to fight for it. So I know you believe it too. So thanks for what you do. And yeah. Projects sure. like this last one depend on our success with the mobility plan. And um, so it, it's, it's real important work because we, we don't get that without this. So, All right. With Thank that, you for all we your are efforts. adjourned. <laughs>